Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today, Jack is joining me for our largest set review ever. Sun and Moon Lost Thunder is coming out, well the pre-releases are starting in about 10 days. And uh, this set is monstrous, it's 214 cards before the secret rares. And there's a bunch of new archetypes a lot of people are excited about. There's lots of very good cards in this set that will definitely be changing how the game is going to be played. So we're both really excited to get going with this. Definitely. And as always, the uh, same sort of system applies. We've got our five-star system. Uh, feel free to pause here if you want to know a little bit more about uh, what each of the stars mean. And as always, you would have seen Joe post in Verbank uh, not too long ago about the community majority ratings. Uh, again, we've decided to throw in what you guys think as well, so we can kind of compare and see what the community think as well as us, because sometimes we are a little bit off with cards, uh, and it's just interesting to see, in general, what people think of the cards before they're out. So yeah, we're kicking off with the uh, trainer cards like usual. Joe, if you want to start us off. Yep, first off, we have a new supporter, Kahili. It is a pretty weak one. We're really going to try and zip through sort of weaker cards, so Kahili draws two, flip a coin if heads, you get to put it back into your hand, so... Half the time, it's basically the effect of a Pokemon Breeder. Half the time, it's a supporter that you get back to get value again, but you're never really happy using the supporter because it's only a draw two. Usually, you want a bigger impact in pretty much every situation. Yeah, it's a worth how. Next up, we have a good supporter, Sightseer. Uh, this is a four-star card. Draw cards from your deck until you have five cards in your hand. Before drawing, you may discard any number of cards from your hands. This is a really, really nice sort of cycle effect. Uh, really, really good synergies with some of the discard mechanics. Things like Malamar, Aquapatch, Solgaleo Prism, and Zygarde all like energy in the bin. So you can discard your energy whilst keeping your Guzmas, keeping your Malamars, uh, all of that good stuff. Keeping your Aquapatches, all of these cards that you really want to hold on to that you wouldn't have been able to with Sycamore. So it's kind of kind of comparable to Sycamore. It's a little bit more balanced. You don't get as many cards, but at the same time, you do get to hold on to some key resources. Uh, it's also a better Sophocles because sometimes you don't have... Um, the cards you need to draw uh, from Sophocles and at the same time sometimes you can just completely ditch your hand and draw five so it can draw more cards than Sophocles and also doesn't have as tight of a constraint it's more flexible um, just in general any discarding any card that or deck that has discard synergies I think we'll, we'll be playing this I think a couple of years ago we may not have even glanced at this card more than once but because of the supporter drought we have right now uh, this is actually one of the better supports we have in these kind of discarding mechanic decks yeah, definitely. I like the flexibility that you can keep one or two of the most important cards in your hand, still get rid of a load of jank and uh, sights here into some new cards, hopefully. Kind of reminds me of something like Professor Rowan, where you're only getting, you know, four more cards or whatever a lot of the time, but you have to keep the most important one. So it lets you create combos and it's just going to be a really good card for, once again, those discard loving decks that you can see a few examples of down there. On to Morty. It's a pretty interesting supporter card. Following the, the theme that we saw with Diantha, where um, it's specific to a certain type of Pokemon, this time it's Psychics. So you can only play this card if one of your Psychic Pokemon was knocked out during your opponent's last turn. Your opponent reveals their hand, choose two cards you find there, and your opponent shuffles them into their deck. So the idea is you're going to punish the opponent for taking that knockout by hopefully making them draw really badly. You remove the two support cards in their hand, you remove a DC and whatever else they're trying to evolve into, all those sorts of things. You're going to try and make them shuffle it back into their deck. Uh, and there are a handful of non-GX psychic attackers out there right now. There's things like Deoxys and Giratina in Malamar builds. There's also Garbodor, things like Espeon Garb, trying to disrupt people, make them play more item cards even. Uh, could be a nice combo, but because it's so specific, um, it has to be after you've received... A knockout and you need to have everything in hand already um so you need to use a supporter that's not drawing you cards that turn for morty to take effect but the idea is to stop your opponent from doing anything and there are still lots of decks that have things like instructor ranguru uh, zoroark and other decks just play off the board so a lot of the time removing one or two cards from their hand will be annoying but they'll still be able to do stuff and that's why we've not rated it super high definitely Next up, we have Mina. This searches your deck for a fur energy and lets you attach it to one of your Pokemon, uh, which is a really, really nice effect. Getting an extra energy attachment is really cool. However, there's only two real um, fairy decks out there right now. Sylveon is uh, magical ribboning every turn, so it means it's always finding an energy plus uh, probably a max potion. So you don't, you're probably going to have the energy in hand anyway, and you want to be using more disruption supporters uh, rather than just minering. 
each turn. And Guard of War simply does not have the space for it. It's a stage two deck, so naturally it's a bit more clunky. Plus you have Secret Spring, so you kind of don't need that extra acceleration because you already have that built in with the attacker. Um, this could be better if we have a new Fairy Archetype coming up in the next couple of sets, but right now uh, there's just not the Fairy Archetype to support Mina. Uh, it's a pretty interesting card, and I don't think it's awful. It's just that there's no real place for it in the format right now. Yeah, powerful effect, just no home for it, especially the fact that it competes with Secret Spring is just kind of silly at the moment. Next up, we have Whitney. This allows you to draw one card, and that doesn't sound great, but uh, you get to draw an additional two cards for each Whitney in your discard pile, excluding the one that you've just played. So um, if there's one already in the bin, you're doing a how effect. If there's two in the bin, you're getting five cards. If there's three in the bin, the dream, uh, you're getting seven cards off of one Whitney, which is a very, very powerful supporter card. It follows the sort of suit of Chorus, where there are times in the game when it'll be really weak, but times in the game where it'll be very strong. I think because we don't have Versus Seeker, Whitney is pretty much just not useful right now, but potentially in things like Expanded, uh, where you have Compressor and lots of other discard mechanics, you could see Whitney. But the thing is, you don't ever have Whitney as a tech card. You need to actually commit four slots to this card, so it feels in a really precarious spot. I think if ever we're going to see Whitney in Standard, it's going to be with these unknown hand creations that people are going to try and come up with. Not too competitive, but... For that deck specifically, it's giving you the most amount of draw out of any supporter we have in standard. Yeah. Next up, we have Professor Elm's Lecture, which is actually the first five-star card of our review. Uh, this card is fantastic. That you search your deck for up to three Pokemon with 60 or less HP, reveal them, and put them into your hand. So it doesn't put them onto the bench like Bridget did. It also doesn't just get basics like Collector did. Um, this searches for three 60 HP Pokemon. So immediately you can see it gets super niche things like Skiploom and Alone Dug Trio. Never going to be too relevant, but just having that extra little layer of flexibility is really, really strong. Um, but there's so many... Like, the, the format has missed Bridget so much. There's so many decks that would have loved Bridget going into this, uh, going into the early stages of this format. It's really, really strong. Uh, we saw how broken Bridget was last format, um, and the, the format really has missed this kind of effect in the early game. Uh, we've had to use things like Je not Je sorry, Lily as our primary source of turn one supporter, which is a good turn one supporter, um, but is less reliable for setup decks. It's really good for pretty much all basic decks, things uh, like Buzzgarb. They want to be using Lily on their first turn. Uh, but things like Zoroark really just want to get Zoroas down on the board and start developing that engine. Uh, and that's exactly what this card does. It, it feels like I could go on about this card for days just because it, the format has needed it so much. You can see all of these little Pokemon underneath Vulpix and Zoroa that it, uh, that it helps. Uh, it's going to increase the consistency of pretty much all Stage 2 decks, a lot of Stage 1 decks too. Um, in general, it feels like Alone and Vulpix is also a much better card now because it's much more searchable. Uh, it was pretty searchable with Brooklyn Hill, but that meant finding your stadiums as well. This also gets you other Pokemon, which is nice, so then you can Vulpix for these evolutions. So it's a really, really strong sort of combination. Um, I don't feel like... I feel this is a pretty obvious five-star. You can see by the community rating, 90% of the community think this is a five-star card. So I'm not going to go on about it too much, but yeah, we saw how good Bridget was, and this is a better Bridget. So yeah, it's just fantastic. Yeah, I love how it's balanced as well. It's intended for setup decks for stage one, and stage two decks trying to evolve into bigger stuff. So unlike Bridget, where we saw like Drampagarb taking advantage, where it could just get two Drampers onto the board straight away, this is a much cleaner way of doing it. So it's a healthy card for the game. It's a huge sigh of relief for Zoroark and other stage twos. As you said, great for Alolan Vulpix. That's really getting pushed as a card because we have this card and we have the Alolan Ninetales later that we'll talk about. So uh, we're going to be seeing lots of those. And it's already a four of in Night March just because Skiploom also has 60 hit points as well. So... Really, really incredible card going into current decks and ones throughout its lifetime, I imagine. From there, we have Aether Foundation Employee. It gets three Alolan Pokemon from your discard pile into your hand. You'll never use this because we have Rescue Stretcher, and that's an item card. Next up, we have Faber. This is very similar to Zerosic. Choose one of your opponent's tool cards, special energy, or stadiums in play. Put it in the Lost Zone. Um, this is theoretically better than Zero Seek because they can't recover it from the discard pile, plus it hits their stadiums. So this is pretty much a straight upgrade to uh, Zero Seek and Expanded. In Standard, however, um, this is a really, really nice tech supporter card. Uh, first off, for the mill archetypes, this is another sort of tool in their basket, along with the already um, so, like already having the Hammers plus Plumeria. Uh, now they have Faber as well, so it's, it's pretty annoying, but it is unfortunately... Um, another little tool for mill archetypes but just in general 
Um, Zerotic was pretty popular throughout its whole career, during, like within the well, yeah, within its lifetime. It was it was always at least a one of in most decks. Um, and right now we have no recovery at all for special energy. Um, so in general, it would like Zerotic would be really good in this format. But not only like that, you then push it to the Lost Zone as well. So it's just like Zerotic would be good now because of how little recovery there is anyway. Well, it doesn't matter because we're able to like pretty much lock out really really strong cards from the format so yeah it's never going to be a four of in anything but mill but it's a nice one or two of in a lot of archetypes especially in a format that looks to uh, like see zorark on the on the throne again it's a nice way of countering that without uh having to find your one of items you can at least lay lay um so yeah it's there's there's flexibility here and there but it's just always going to be a pretty good card. It's never going to be a five-star broken card, but it's never going to be in the back of the binder not seeing play. It's just a good card. Yeah, it seems good when Zoroark is increased in play and also very good in Zoroark itself. Mm. And we've seen Zoro Control be an archetype previously, and this is a great card for that toolkit as well. So versatile, hitting so many things, tools, stadiums, and special energy. And as you said, the Lost Zone, where it's literally inaccessible right now, a really good place to put those cards when you don't want to deal with them ever again in the game. Next up, we have Lusamine Prism Star. Um, this is a really interesting card. Um, you can only play it if your opponent has three prize cards remaining. So it's similar to all these um, Ultra Beast style cards where it's all based on prize cards. And the effect is prevent all damage done to your Ultra Beasts by your opponent's attacks during your opponent's next turn. So the idea is um, people are trying to play around Sledgehammer turns. Uh, so they're going to try and go to three prizes so they don't go on Sledgehammer if you're against the Buzzwall deck. And then they fall into the trap of Lusamine and suddenly you go B-string onto a Buzzwall GX, attack with that whilst using Lusamine and they can't respond on your Buzzwall. They have to Guzma around you. And even by them using Guzma, they reactivate your Buzzwall's attack. That's the dream situation. But really, because it's just a one-of, that you don't really want to use a Lele to find because they can then just Guzma up your Lele and still take two prizes, putting them down to one, which is really scary. Um, so you kind of just need to have it in your hand naturally. Maybe if you're using a Buzzwell Mad Cargo engine. Um, I know a lot of people are going to be moving to an Alolan Ninetales engine, so maybe it's a bit out of date, but Lucamine seems good in that list, but it doesn't really seem to fit naturally into many others. Um, I don't think it'll go into Malamar lists because you don't have enough draw power. Similarly for like beast box builds, potentially the Cephalon because you are playing lots of draw with the Heat Factory Stadium and Acro Bikes and stuff like that. Um, but again, you're just trying to get lucky and have it on the turn that you need it. It's a huge like blowout effect if it works, especially if you are something like the Blessed Cephalon where you're literally only using Ultra Beast Pokemon other than the Lele's that you've put down. Um, but if that's not the case, it's just going to be a wasted slot and you could have something more consistent overall. Yeah, just the fact that we don't have an Ultra Beast that draws or searches itself kind of kind of means that you're going to always give up something to play this. I mean, so I think a lot of the time it's not gonna, quite going to be worth uh, the effect that it gets just because you're probably not helping yourself enough. Next up, we have Electric Powers. is another five-star card. Uh, during your turn, your Lightning Pokemon's attacks do 30 more damage to your opponent's active Pokemon. So this is three plus powers for Lightning types in a single card, which means you can play... Uh, four of these, which means you can play 12 plus powers, but only use a third of the space. Uh, you can do a bonus 120 damage throughout the game, all on one turn, across four turns, however you want to do it um, with your Lightning Pokemon. And that's crazy good. It's Steam Up on an item card that works on EXs and non-EXs, uh, sorry, GXs and non-GXs. Um, it makes for really, really good numbers as well. Tapu Koko pushes to 160 with one electric power, means that, meaning that Choice Band pushes it to 190, which is really, really nice. Similarly, Zorora is pushed to 190 with one electric power, meaning that you don't need the Choice Band so you can play uh, weakness policies in Zorora so you're not worried about fighting stuff. So just in general, it pushes some really, really nice numbers. Um, it's just, again, it's just another fantastic card. A plus 30 is always going to be really, really strong. People are playing... To Kukui right now, not only for the extra draw uh, with like my cargo engines, but just because the plus 20 can make the difference in certain matchups. And this is a plus 30 and it's an item card. So, just in general, again, another really, really strong card. There's also a lot of synergies in the um, future coming out of this to be able to get these back, to be able to reuse them from the discard pile. So, just in general, this is seeing this is like how they're pushing lightning as an archetype for the next two years. It's going to be uh, we have lightning Pokemon that don't have fantastic attacks initially, but when you pair them with electric powers and sort of the bonus cards that they have, uh, which we'll see more in the next set, 
um, you're just you're able to do much more efficient trading uh, whilst having some normally subpar attacks that are actually pushed into crazy, crazy numbers. Yeah, what I love is as well, this isn't just for reaching one hit knockouts. So if you look at Tapu Koko, just doing a flying flip with a choice band and one electric power, that's 80 active and 20 toward the bench. That's like the Volcanium Prism Star. Like, that's insane. Just for a DCE, that value is ridiculous. So I think uh, this has got to see play alongside big Zorora decks, but also, you know, there could, there's plenty of Coco decks already out there right now. And if you go to a heavier Coco focus and have electric powers in there, Flying Flips is going to get so dirty. It's already an insane attack, but my goodness, it gets pushed even further with this card. Next up, we have counter, uh, Custom Catcher. Sorry, uh, This is one of these effects where you can play two at once. If you play just one Custom Catcher, uh, you get to draw cards until you have three in hand. So it's an Instruct effect like Oranguru. But if you have two of them at the same time and choose to play them together, you get to choose one of your opponent's bench Pokemon and switch it with the active. So it's a Lysander effect with these two custom catchers. It has the similar issues or drawbacks that Puzzle of Time always used to have, where you need to be playing an engine where you can try and get these into the hand consistently, so it pretty much instantly limits it to something like a Zoroark variant, or using something like the newer Lola Ninetales that we'll discuss later to get them consistently in the hand. But when it is in the hand, it's a very, very powerful effect. We've seen how often um, Counter Catcher has been played in decks just to have that sort of gust whilst being able to do other things with your support of a turn. We've seen that this is just really good. Gust is incredible in the game always. And I do like, to be fair, if you are just an aggressive deck, just being able to use one in a pinch and just get you more cards. We saw that Bicycle was in aggressive decks for a long time when you had enough cards that could just be insta-played. And this could be a similar situation. So I think there is versatility here. It doesn't naturally go like immediately into Zoroark, I don't think, because we already have Lycanroc, which serves so many purposes, as well as giving you Gust. Uh, but it's definitely going to be an option for those sorts of decks, so it's going to be one to explore. Yeah, definitely. The other thing about Custom Catcher is you can't really see it, you can't really view it in the same way as Puzzle of Time, which I think some people are doing, because Puzzle of Time, at the same time, was a recovery card, so Zoroark didn't mind trading to find its puzzles because it always knew it could get back what it traded. It was a very different effect with Custom Catcher, and I think people kind of um, sometimes forget that the recovery effect was why Puzzle was good, not just because it was this broken two-card combo that you could find. This is another broken two-card combo, but it's a lot more punishing if you start trading all your Guzmas just to try and find uh, in your energy, just to try and find um, your custom catches because then it's it's stuff that you can't get back anymore. So yeah, it's a really, really strong effect, and I think it will see play in some archetypes, but it's not, com not as comparable as I think some people are making it to uh, Puzzle Time. Next up, we have Mix Herb. This is another of these effects. You can play two Mix Herb cards at once. If you play one, you remove a special condition from your active. If you play two, you remove all special conditions and 90 damage from your active. So it's essentially a gold potion when you play two, plus you get rid of special conditions. Uh, special conditions aren't too big right now. Things like confusion, uh, dip in and out of play, um, may see a little bit more play coming uh, with Blacephalon being able to confuse and burn you. Um, but at the same time, this effect just isn't strong enough as a one-card combo or as a two-card combo. Um, again, you'd, there's nothing that really is worried enough about special conditions to uh, actually have to worry enough to play mix herbs and for anything that wants to be recovering hp we have things like acerola max potion anyway so finding the two card combo often isn't going to be viable when we have more efficient answers um that are still in the format so yeah it's just not quite as good as things like acerola and max potion which are just always going to be better Next up, we have Netball. This is a card I'm really excited about. I think this is incredible. You get to search your deck for a basic grass Pokemon or grass energy, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your deck. It's like they've merged Nest Ball, which has seen a lot of play, and just given it a free energy search as well. Uh, so it means that, you know, there are those times when Nest Ball is found in the late game and it's just useless for you. You basically burn it and don't even search for a target. You never get that now because Net Ball can choose to get you a grass energy as well. So... In a pinch in the early game, uh, you can pick up an energy, or you can just start developing your board, and you know that this card is never dead late on, which is excellent for you. It lets you get a little bit cheeky with counts, something like a Galissapod uh, Mag Cargo deck that we actually saw do well in a recent tournament. That can instantly play four netballs and just reduce its grass energy count to gain consistency overall. Uh, there's stage two decks like Decidueye and Sceptile. Imagine a Decidueye deck being able to just play like two grass energies that's really insane, and it's 
accessible now because netball gives you six outs to find them it's insane and there's also the lost march deck which will be playing a very low count of energy that can take advantage of this and a bunch of other grass stuff as well so this is going to be a staple in all grass decks going forward and to be honest we have a good amount of them at the moment definitely next up we have adventuring satchel uh this lets you search your deck for two tool cards reveal them and put them into your hand uh, this is an insta search too which is really really strong and searching for tools uh, if you're playing tools that have an effect uh, immediately when you attach them like do it like choice band that kind of thing uh, this can be a really really strong card however there's no real reason to play this over just playing a fourth tool a lot of the time um, there's not many decks that are playing a tool split maybe if you're playing a tool split you could find space for a satchel instead but in standard it's just not as n not as good as just playing the actual tools themselves um, in standard I guess Rotom kind of doesn't mind it but at the same time uh, we're pretty sure Rotom is much worse, not that it was fantastic anyway, but is much worse now with Giratina, as Giratina um, is is just pretty much infinitely better than Rotom. Um, so yeah, it's in standard it's not really going to have any uh, amazing synergies. And in Expanded, we do have Tool Drop, uh, which is a nice use. It's an extra plus, it's like a plus 20, uh, I guess a plus 70 if you're finding Choice Band. Uh, with the satchel, so it's a cool plus 70, that's really, really strong, but at the same time, you're probably going to be running so many tools to attach anyway, you're probably just going to be able to naturally find them, uh, rather than just running satchels, so it's just not quite efficient enough. A search to a chooser two is really, really strong, but and the cards it finds are strong, but in general, a lot of the time, you just want to be playing that extra tool instead. Yeah, I'd agree. The fact that it takes up slots is really annoying. You don't ever want to play, like, four adventuring satchel, I don't think. You don't ever have space. And you only ever want to see it early. So it's that weird thing where you have to get kind of lucky to hit your two of before you hit the tools themselves a lot of the time. But being able to draw two on an item card is really insane. It's just frustrating that it's only functioning really for the Rotom and Trubbish decks right now. Next up we have React Hammer. This card is... Ugh. I mean, it can only be used by the player going second on their first turn. Discard an energy from one of your opponent's Pokemon in play. So either you have to play one of this card and... Half the time you go first and it's instantly useless. And, you know, like that one in ten games where it's in your opening hand, you get to use it going second. Or you play four copies of this and it's useful 40% um, going second. But then you have four dead slots every time you go first. It's ridiculously bad. And think about those times where people just don't attach turn one. How sad are you going to be then when you face a Zoroark player that doesn't put their DCU down turn one? This card is just absolutely terrible. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty bad. Next up, we have Lost Mixer. This is one of the first Lost Zone synergy cards. You put two cards from your hand into the Lost Zone, then you draw a card from your deck. Super simple. Um, like, pretty much cycling one is fine. It's not great, but it's not awful. Um, but there's, obviously, the, the point is there's synergies. It's a minus one. Um, no, it's a minus two, sorry, for Granville, which is a card we'll talk about later, which does more damage uh, based on your hand size. But there's also... Uh, this the whole Lost March uh, archetype that's coming out in this set, which is similar to Night March, but based on the Lost Zone instead. So you can Lost Zone two Pokemon and then draw a card. Um, so you're not only cycling to your combo pieces, you're also putting more combo pieces that you need into the Lost Zone to increase your damage. Um, it's not ever going to be a draw engine because it's only ever a draw one, and it's like it, it uh, minuses cards from your hand, so it's not a draw engine. It's just an engine for decks that look to put, put things into the Lost Zone which right now we have Lost March. Um, so that's why it's a three-star Lost March. looks to be a Tier 2 deck. Um, and therefore, this will be a hugely important card in that deck. But at the same time, right now, we don't have any other Lost Zone-based decks, so there's no real other synergies with it. Yeah, vital for Lost March. Also really great for Gramble. That draw one is deceptively powerful because it plays a thick line of Mad Cargo. So really awesome for lowering your hand size, guaranteeing that that draw one is the card you need to keep that deck ticking over. So very cool in those two archetypes. Next up, we have Moomoo Milk. It is a reprint. You choose one of your Pokemon, flip two coins for each head to remove three counters from that Pokemon. Obviously, its own effect is very weak, but we do get a Milk Tank in this set, which has synergy with it, which we'll talk about later. Obviously, that deck is probably not going to be that strong, but keep an eye out for Milk Tank later on. Yeah. Next up, we have Counter Gain, which I think is one of my favorite cards from the set. It's a really, really cool card. As long as you have more prize cards remaining than your opponent, the attacks of this Pokemon, of the attacks of the Pokemon this card has attached to, cost colorless less. So it's similar to Energy Gain um, from the old SP era. However, your 
you have to be behind on prizes but at the same time this can be attached to anything which is really really cool and just in general this i think has such longevity to it. it it's going to be good at some point a minus one from attacks is already crazy good it can half like with as you, as you can see here with lycan rock uh with nine tails it halves their attack cost which is crazy um that's that's just bonkers like in itself but on top of that, it's not it, it's not only like non EXs or it or uh, EXs. It's all of them. It's ever like you can attach it to anything, which is another really really crazy effect. Um, I just think this card is really really strong. There's no way I don't think it will see play at some point in its lifespan. Sort of combos wise, uh, it lets you dangerous rogue on a lightning rock for one energy, meaning that you can have a rock rough down. And if you're if you're behind on prizes, that rock rough is even more of a threat than ever. A lot of the time, people are targeting rock roughs anyway. Uh, but if you're able to keep a rock rough down once you're behind on prizes, you can dangerous rogue, which is debatably one of the strongest GX attacks in the game for one single energy, which is crazy. Uh, you can also use nine tails, both of nine tails attacks for one energy, which is really really strong. Uh, nine tails has a 70 30 snipe for one energy is bonkers, and its GX attack knocks out an ultra beast, which again taking two prizes um, on like a buzzwall GX or a blacephalon for one energy is just stupid good. So yeah. In those kind of situations, it's really, really strong. But also for things like spread decks, Coco attacking for one energy and a counter gain is really, really cool. Um, Black Rain GX for just a DCE is crazy good. All of these kind of spread decks that like to go behind on prizes and then just win in a turn with either Black Ray or Tapu Lele. Uh, just letting Shrine ticks, like sort of clock up, uh, flying, flipping, all of that good stuff. You're not taking prizes until the turn you win the game, so it's just making you accelerate your game plan even quicker because you have counter gain now, which means you don't need to find as many energy, which is just stupid good. Yeah, it's really awesome. It's a really versatile card. I think Zora Rock Mirror is going to become such a headache, by the way, because it used to be that like if you just dealt with a Rock Ruff with an energy, you're fine, but then you look over and there's a Rock Ruff without an energy, and you're like, oh no, I can still just get Dangerous Road and lose. It's so It's going to be super weird. Um, but yeah, counter gain, very good. I think it will be played in Zora Rock, like definitely at least a one of. I think it will be played in most Alolan Ninetales as well. I think it makes sense. Um, just because you can search it so freely with its own ability. So I think those definitely, and there's going to be a handful of other cards that we have to completely reevaluate when you're behind and you're a one attack cost cheaper. It can be a way different story of how the game sort of flows. So very, very powerful card. Next up, we have Spell Tag, another powerful tool. If the Psychic Pokemon this card is attached to is knocked out by damage from an opponent's attack, put four counters on your opponent's Pokemon in any way that you like. So it's a similar effect to Bursting Bloom that we've seen. Obviously, it remains on your target, but it has to get knocked out in the process. So although there are some pretty tricky GX Pokemon like Banette and Espeon GX, I think we're going to be looking mainly at non-GX targets here to try and get that proc you know, a few times throughout the game. And the fact that you can place these counters in a perfect sort of amount means you never waste damage, which you potentially could have done with Bursting Balloon. And the opponent just can't pass around it forever like they could with Balloon as well. So at some point, the spell tag is going to get them. It has amazing synergy, most likely with the Giratina that we're going to be talking about later on, um, because Tina already spreads damage and will be in a Shrine Coco build. It just means that if they're starting to deal with your spreaders and attackers, they're going to get even more damage on their least favorite target. So it really puts your opponent in a bad spot, forcing Guzmas every turn, forcing field blowers, all these sorts of things. It's going to be a massive headache for players because spell tag is such a pain to deal with. Yeah. Next up, we have the fairy charms. There are four of these. Prevent all damage done to the fairy Pokemon this card is attached to by the effect of your opponents, either fighting, grass, dragon, or psychic Pokemon EX and GX. Um, so yeah, this is similar to the, similar to the Silver Ballet tools. A um, bit more versatile because obviously the tools can only be attached to one Pokemon there, whereas this can be any fairy type. Uh, the immediate sort of thought is Sylveon. This means that um, theoretically we don't take damage from a huge range of Pokemon. Grass is getting a lot of support. Uh, obviously Buzzwall is really, really good for the fighting types. Dragon got a lot of support with Dragon Majesty. They shouldn't ever be too big of an issue, but things like V-Karay... Um, if you attach one of these and they're not playing Field Blower, a Ray, Ray can never knock you out, which is really cute. And then Malamar, obviously, is another fantastic deck, which is covered by the Psychic stuff. Um, all of these are actually relevant types right now, which is really, really cool. But at the same time, um, f finding that one specific one can... Uh, if it's just Field Blowered off, it's kind of 
you know, you can't play multiple... Uh, you can't play, like, two of all of the fairy charms just so you don't get field blow because that's eight slots of your deck, which is just, like, Sylveon needs to play a lot of cards now. It doesn't have the strong supporters like Flare Grunt and Handiwork. So you can't give up eight slots of your deck just in case your opponent's playing one field blower. Plus, at the same time, if they're playing one field blower, if they field blow the right turn, they're probably getting a knockout anyway. So it doesn't work out quite well for Sylveon. Uh, and in general, this kind of goes back to Mina. There's no other huge fairy deck right now that would necessarily want to play this. Guardi, again, doesn't have the space. It needs to be like playing consistency cards. It can't find space for a couple of fairy charms that will win certain matchups because you're probably going to win more matchups just by setting up a huge mon rather than trying to find your one-off cute card that you can just stick on a routes and they can never get rid of. It's you, you know It doesn't always work. So these are really, really cool cards. And if we, again, ever get a fairy deck that has a specific issue with one certain archetype, maybe it just cannot handle Buzzrock. Um, that, that's where these cards are kind of going to see use, similar to how if Silvalo was good, it wouldn't play two of all of the memories. It would just play a couple of specific memories based on the meta. Uh, but right now, there's just no room for this card in any of the fairy decks that are being played right now. Yeah, I'd say Sylveon would rather have something like a Choice Helmet or the Dumbbells, because it's just universal, and these cards will be useful in like... 10 or 15 percent of your games and you'd rather have a slot dedicated to something that's always useful for you most of the time unless as jack said a, a naughty matchup pops up that you just can't beat without them next up we actually do have choice helmet i've just mentioned the card it's a tool that um when attached the pokemon takes 30 less damage from your opponent's gx and ex pokemon gonna be a really nice card for again trying to keep tanky and out of range of certain attackers uh, straight away, sort of mill and stall archetypes come to mind to make these guys even more difficult to knock out. But basically, any card that doesn't require a choice ban for math fixing can consider this choice helmet instead to make itself that little bit more tanky and awkward to knock out. I think it is versatile most of the time. Having immediate damage is preferred. But if there are certain attackers out there that don't require choice ban for fixing your numbers, you can consider this choice helmet card. Yeah, definitely. And if field blower counts are still as low as they are currently, um, you're probably able to stick this and uh, make sure it's well. Yeah, it sticks a lot more. Uh, but in general, I think it's not quite as good as the plus thirty rather than the reduced thirty. Next up, we have our first th uh, Stadium Prism Star Thunder Mountain Prism Star. Uh, this is a really really cool card. The attacks of your Lightning Pokemon um, cost one Lightning less. Just it's it's just a flat one Lightning less. So I've just mentioned with counter gain how strong a minus one is on attacks. Well, this is uh, with counter gain, it's a minus two. You can you're a Zorora can attack, but one energy that's broken. Um, but no, just in general, this this card is really really strong. If you get one use out of this card, I think you're getting pretty much your your value for it because it is only a one of. You don't have to play it. It doesn't take up a huge amount of your deck, so it's not like you're giving up too much deck space. Uh, which is, it's a really, really weird balancing thing. It, this couldn't be a four-off because it's too broken, but it's also really, really strong because it's only a one-off, so it means that you're not, like, having to find a lot of space uh, in your deck to sort of use this. So, yeah, it's a really, really strong card. Um, another note about the Prism Star Stadiums is that they can't be bounced by items or supporters. They can only be bounced by stadiums. It's not too relevant because right now stadium counts are pretty high because everyone's trying to bounce Shrine or play Shrine. So everyone either has a counter stadium or is the stadium to be beating. But that being said, uh, like I say, I think even if you get one proc out of this card, uh, you're still getting really, really strong value because it means that you can set up another attacker on the bench um, rather than having to put energy into an attacker that may be knocked out next turn or is initially a bit weaker. Um, it means that you can start preparing your board state on the bench instead of having to front load energy. And then if you manage to get an extra proc out of this card, it's even it's just crazy at that point. It's so, so strong. Uh, it, like like I say, it means you can be attacking uh, with Zorora, with Tapu Koko for one energy. Both of these cards have some inbuilt acceleration as well. Um, so they, they're going to be able to accelerate to themselves and hopefully then um, sort of just get so much value out of maybe one proc, potentially even two procs. The fact that you always get one proc as well is really, really strong. It means that you can put it down. Maybe when you know your opponent is down to their last stadium or something, um, you can try and keep this in play and just make sure you're the last stadium standing because field blowers don't affect this card. Yeah, I mean, it's really awesome value, uh, as Jack said. 
Um, mean, making your Zorora attack on turn two just more consistent is amazing. Uh, it means that you don't have to go full voltage turn one, which otherwise you might have had to do. So although it is a one-off, it's kind of RNG based on when you can hit this card, but it's just really awesome. Like you're always happy to see it in every, in every turn of the game, I think, just because being able to attack with less commitment is always good for you. And especially because Zerora has free retreat on all its dudes. If you draw that Thunder Mountain that turn, you can just retreat into a different Zerora that has only one attachment on it. Attach return, put that stadium in, and boom. Then you've got two Zeroras set up for, you know, like uh, two-thirds of the price, which is excellent. So uh, Thunder Mountain, just an awesome card for these decks. Currently, this is, these are the only homes for it, but um, it's just going to be a stadium that we need to keep an eye on throughout now that we have these Lightning Archetypes. Next up, we have another Prism Star Stadium card. This is the Grass Stadium Life Forest Prism Star. Once during each player's turn, that player may heal 60 damage and remove all special conditions from one of their Grass Pokemon. And again, it has that text. Um, it can only be removed by other stadiums themselves. So Faber and Field Blower, no dice for those. But it is the effect of a Pokemon Center Lady, which used to be a supporter card. And turning a supporter card into the effect of a stadium card is such mega value. It's awesome. I mean, PCL wasn't overly used, but it did not It did see play here and there. And the fact that we have a potential new tanking archetype in this Sceptile GX deck just puts it instantly into it. I think um, a heal of 60 can push you out of range sometimes of a two-hit KO. Uh, not having to worry about special conditions is a nice headache that you don't have to deal with. And like Jack said, if this stays in play more than once, you get such amazing value for you. Um, it doesn't have to be the active, it can be anywhere on the board as well, so if you're retreating around, trying to heal stuff off, forcing people to Guzma you faster, that's going to be really good as well. Really putting a clock on your opponent uh, for the amount of times you can get use of this, it's just going to be insane. A real headache for spread decks as well, it puts a lot of pressure on them to keep drawing cards, and most of the time the shrine decks aren't, you know, heavily focused on Lele's or whatever else, they don't have a huge engine. And um, if you can keep that forest in play for a couple turns, you're really going to be feeling the benefits of it because it can get into serious value town. Yeah. Similarly with uh, the next uh, sort of, well, yeah, this is the fire version of these stadiums, uh, the Heat Factory Prism Star. Um, this is Ninetales Roche Reveal's ability. Before you, uh, once you're at your turn, you may discard a fire engine from your hand. If you do, you can draw three cards. And there are these fantastic stadiums that will probably almost insta be insta-bounced just because if they stay in play for more than one turn, they get so much value, it's crazy. Again, this obviously has the caveat. Uh, the same as the other two, it can't be bounced by anything other than stadiums. Uh, but just in general, Fire actually is another type that gets a lot of support this set. We get uh, Mancargo, which we'll talk about, and we get the Cephalon, which we'll talk about. And for both of these decks, it is a really, really strong effect. Both of these um, sort of don't mind energy in the discard. My cargo a little bit more so, but Blacephalon actually enjoys the energy in the discard so it can attach back to itself um, and just do huge damage with its attack. So it's not only a consistency card, it also sets up damage for Blacephalon, which is crazy good. In comparison to Strong uh, Scorched Earth, sorry, it's more cards, but you can only use one type of energy. So it's kind of sort of um, not, not similar as in uh, sort of power level, but it, Scorched Earth is a little bit more versatile. But that one extra card, I think, is strong enough to say this is just crazy good. This will be seen in all fire decks and is another one that pretty much as soon as you see it, you just have to insta-bounce it because the value they can get, um, an opponent can get from drawing three for discarding a fire is so good. Back when uh, Ninetales Rose Reveal was out, like it was pretty much a priority target whenever you could um, at, like deal with it just because the consistency this kind of effect gives is stupidly strong especially on like a in a, in a deck based around a non-ex attack uh, a one sorry a basic attacker um like blacephalon yeah i love the synergy that it has not only is three cards insane it works amazing with the mag cargos and with blacephalon for getting stuff in the bin just amazing synergy here for the fire stuff finally before we move on to the pokemon we have memory energy it provides a colorless energy and the pokemon this card is attached to you can use the attacks of its previous evolutions I still need the necessary energy to perform the attack, though. So we already have Shining Celebi with that time recall ability. It is much better to have this effect on an energy card because you save yourself space and you don't have to search it out. Um, so the memory energy is a slight upgrade to that, but we're still really scratching our heads for a real good target for this card. I don't feel like there's many decks out there that really need to 
um, use previous Evo attacks. Maybe there are some sort of flail mechanics and stuff that you need to keep an eye out for for future. But I think that's about it. The slight upgrade to memory energy as well is the surprise factor. When people see a Shining Celebi, they, they will instantly look at your lower form and see what attack they have to play around. Memory Energy doesn't have that, so there is a slight upgrade there in addition to the fact that you're saving bench space and all that other stuff, but it is really minute, I think. Yeah. So yeah, onto the Pokemon, kicking off with the grass stuff, we have Grovile and Sceptile GX. Uh, for a couple of these mons, we've linked them together because in general, uh, they sort of complement one another, and we both rated both of the Pokemon at a similar star rating anyway. So in general, the Grovile Sceptile GX package is a four star. Uh, King things off with the Grovile, it has the ability Sunshine Grace, uh, which lets you search your deck for a Pokemon, for a Grass Pokemon once per turn and put it into your hand. Uh, this is crazy good for uh, like consistency. It's bonkers how consistent this makes Stage 2 Grass decks. It's so, so good. Um, the old Gabite had it, and it was basically uh, what made Garchomp Altaria ever see competitive play. It was never fantastic, uh, but at the same time, it was the only reason the deck saw play was the fact that it was a stage two deck that was super consistent in a format full of basics. It could actually compete, which was really, really strong. Uh, we technically do already have this in Shinotic, but the thing is, Shinotic is not a good Pokemon. It doesn't attack very... It doesn't have a good attack. And it doesn't evolve into Sceptile GX, which is a, a big enough deal to um, make Grovile good because you're also searching out stuff that you're evolving into, which is really, really strong. We've already mentioned Sceptile a couple of times. It's a 230 HP stage two Grass GX that is weak to fire and has one retreat. First attack for Grass, the 60 damage, Matt Cut discards a special energy from your opponent's active Pokemon. Uh, that's really, really strong, like I say, in a format with not very many um, sort of special energy recovery mechanics. Uh, you can actually grind your opponents out really, really well. Um, things like Zoroarks don't ever want to see this kind of effect. Uh, the 60 damage is also a good amount of damage to be doing for one energy, uh, with a choice banner, Lorantis, you're doing 110, which means you're two-shotting almost everything in the format, uh, whilst also disrupting them at the same time, which is really, really cool. The Cyclone for 130 uh, does 130 for two grass, and lets you move a grass energy from this Pokemon to one of your benched. Um, so that means you can sort of attach uh, attach the second grass, deal 130, which pushes up to 180 with a Lorantis and a choice band, which is a really, really nice number to be hitting. Uh, you then are able to move the energy to a Sceptile on the bench, uh, meaning that you only have to attach one energy next turn if this one uh, gets knocked out because you've already got one energy ready set up. But at the same time, it also means that you're uh, you're you're losing less sort of uh, tempo when you if if your septile does get knocked out. Along with that, you also have sort of you're you're less worried about things like max potion. You can use this as we say as like a tanky archetype because you're only losing one energy if you max potion. Um, so you can max potion and then attach and still mat cut the same turn, uh, which is really, really nice. It's like, it, it just feels like a really, really strong, difficult deck to uh, ever reach that 230 if they're always disrupting you with the discard special energy. It's really, really annoying. On top of all of that healing as well, we have Jungle Heal GX for grass, which heals all damage from each of your Pokemon with any grass energy attached to them. Uh, that's That's like really, really strong in the late game when... Uh, your opponent's starting to run out of Guzmans and stuff. You can start moving around a little bit with your Sceptiles, letting them all take a hit and deal some damage, and then finally you can jungle heal and pretty much reset your board, uh, meaning that your opponent has 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 to find a way of dealing with these huge 230 HP Sceptiles again uh, whilst they're still continu continuously disrupting you and setting up each other, which is nice. You also have the Sceptile from the last set, um, which has... Uh, the sort of inbuilt resistance to Ultra Beasts as well. It looks like Ultra Beasts are going to be a really, really strong uh, or, or are getting a lot of support in this set. So having that nice inbuilt um, sort of, not resistance, but uh, well, complete immunity is really, really strong, especially as when you're also weak to fire. So Blacephalon naturally would be a bad matchup. They're probably going to target down the Sceptile, but if they're targeting down the Sceptile, um, at least they're not, they're at least they're only taking one prize. And at the same time, if you're running like a three Sceptile GX2 baby septile line you can potentially even cycle your baby septiles so they're always only ever taking one prize and they can never do anything to you without finding a way of discarding your energy or you playing lele stuff like that down it can actually mean that your fight uh, fire is weakness which would normally be an issue with Bacephalon being in the set is like completely negated which is really cool i completely love this card i really do love the archetype i think it has answers for so many things 
while I'm running down matchups in my head, I'm thinking, okay, we have Matt Cut and a bunch of Max Potions for Zoroark, great news. We have Leaf Cyclone that can get to 180 damage, which is good for just, in general, good pressure, whilst preserving energy cards just makes the Max Potion thing work. It feels like it's a Broken Guardi deck, but you don't need to Secret Spring a bunch, you just need one energy a turn, which is excellent. You have, um, like you said, the Baby Sceptile, which gives you great coverage against Buzzrock. You already have good typing against Lycanroc, obviously. Great against Placephalon, giving you a way to win the game. You can also just leave Cyclone onto the Baby Sceptile, and then it stays there the whole time, which is excellent. Forcing them to literally just Guzma, um, like Lele's and stuff. And as long as you don't overbench, you should just be able to win that game, because a lot of the Placephalon lists I've seen early on aren't playing any other attackers other than Ultra Beasts, so that's awesome for you. That Jungle Hill GX giving you an out uh, spread variant as well. I mean, it's just got answers for so many things. I think because we have this uh, Sunshine Grace Grovile, we're going to be relatively consistent. And I think getting this going um, fairly consistently is going to be getting you into the game and being able to win everything. It feels like a 50-50 deck because it just has enough answers within itself to beat a lot of things. I think it falls down against some non-GX powerhouse decks like um, the Lost Marches and stuff that can go up to those huge numbers. But other than that, I think it's got a bunch of answers. A quick note on Alolan Executor. That was one of the lists we saw in Japan, where it was kind of a thinner line of the Sceptile. You almost just used the um, the Power of Nature Sceptile to give you, again, an out to beating Buzzwall and um, the Blacephalon. So it's like almost a tech option. And it's weird to call a stage two line a tech line, but because we have these Grovals, it just works really cleanly. You just go... Uh, from your Tricos into Grovals, those Grovals will get you your alone and eggs, and then the next turn they'll turn into Sceptiles. It just sounds really neat, and I think this package is going to be used on its own for a big archetype that's trying to tank, but also could be sort of inserted into other Stage 1 Grass decks because of the power of that Search ability from Grovile anyway. Yeah, this having Netball as well is just also super good. Yeah, Netball is insane for this, for early game and for keeping you Leaf Cycloning too. Right, so on to Ninjask and Shedinja, a pretty cool package that always uh, seem to go together. Ninjask's ability Shed Shell, when you play this card from your hand to evolve one of your Pokemon during your next uh, during your turn, you may put a Shedinja from your discard pile onto your bench. Um, it does have an attack as well for a grass energy, it does 40, flip a coin of heads, 40 more damage. We do have Victory Star Victini in the format, and again we do have Lorantis and Choice Band and stuff, but I don't think this is ever going to be a non-GX attacking deck, even though you could be attaching... Uh, Shedinja's to yourself. I think you need Choice Band to make the Ninjas damage meaningful. Um, so you could be using the Ninjas just to get Shedinja's into play, or you could just be playing Shedinja's on their own. Its ability is Life Vessel. Once during your turn, before you attack, you may discard all cards attached to this Pokemon and attach it to one of your Pokemon as a tool. If the Pokemon this card is attached to is knocked out, your opponent takes one fewer prize card. So it is literally turning into a Life Do as you attach it. And that's going to be really annoying for the opponent, you know. If you attach this onto a Zoroark, your opponent's only taking one prize for all that effort. And you know how annoying it can be to deal with Zoroarks. Um, I think it could definitely see play in Expanded with Vespiquen. Because you want to have lots of Pokemon. You want those Ninkadas to hit the discard pile for you. And having more life to effects is going to be a real pain. So I think it's a natural fit there. In Standard, at the moment, I have my hands up in the air trying to think, like, yes, it's going to be annoying for Zoroark. Can any other decks get this set up consistently? I'm not too sure. Um, maybe in other non-GX grass decks where you have that Grovile to search out the Ninjasks for you, but I think it might be too many spaces in a lot of situations, so that's where my biggest concern lies for these two cards. Yeah, I can't see where this goes yet, but the effect is definitely really, really cool. And I've seen how... Um, little field blow is being played right now, so theoretically you can stop your opponent ever really taking a prize with a deck like this, which is pretty cool. Next up we have a new Vespiquen. Uh, this is kind of a really, really nice budget deck. It's not super competitive, but it is a really, really cheap deck that I think um, should be like relatively hard-hitting as well. Uh, we kick things off with a combi that has B-March, search your deck for up to three combi and put them onto your bench. This is a really, really nice early game consistency attack. Um... Not only does it bench them, uh, well, not only does it search them and shoot them out, it also benches them, meaning that they can all evolve uh, during the next turn, which is really, really nice. Um, means that your net balls can be saved for things like Tricos and uh, Fermantuses, which are going to help consistency uh, and doing more damage, which is nice. The uh, Vespercoin itself has Queen Command for 120 for one energy. 
but this only this attack only works if you have five grass Pokemon on your bench. So anyone playing a pseudo Wudo pretty much auto wins you, which is super sad. You have to set up like a Lorantis or a Grovile to actually attack them. Uh, but in general, if they're not, if people aren't playing pseudo Wudo, this is a really, really like I say, it's a nice. Uh, budget deck it's none of these cards should cost too much Lorantis Promo is probably the most expensive card in the deck and they're like three four pounds so that's five six dollars at most um and then you, you have like the consistency of the Grovile engine which is going to find you a Vespico in every turn you have early game setting up your bees um which means you can netball for your Fermantises uh your Grovile again search for Vespicoins but also searches for extra damage through Lorantis uh, you can actually do 170 for one energy with one Lorantis and a Choice Band, uh, which is obviously killing a Lele, uh, which is a really, really nice attack. So, yeah, it's not fantastic. It's not going to be a Tier 1 meta deck, but it is uh, a really, really nice introductory deck as well. It, in, it introduces you to searching things out, um, bonus damage, sort of different things uh, like min-maxing, searching before you play supporters, that kind of thing. It's a really, really nice introduction deck to the game. It's super simple as well. Um, it's just a nice little package that we get between Grovile and the Vespican line. Yeah, this was definitely a slide made as a nod to the newer player, especially because you're already investing on a few Groviles and Lorantises. If you like the deck and want to play Pokemon more, you can go into a Sceptile deck and uh, start being more competitive, but definitely a nod to new players. This is a cool sort of introductory archetype that you could go for for some fun. Next up we have Meganium. Now there is some speculation on this Meganium's ability. We're not certain whether or not it has the old rare candy effect or the current rare candy effect. We've rated the card based on the old, oh sorry, on the current rare candy effect where you can't just put down a Trico then use Meganium's ability and go straight into a Sceptile. If that was the case, it would probably be a 101 line in the Sceptile deck. As we are right now, we don't think it's necessarily worth it. Its ability is, as I said, that sort of rare candy effect, but you can do it once per turn. So as long as you get the Meganium up and going, the idea is that you can get your other stage twos online. I think it only really makes sense as a thin line in the grass decks because you have Grovile to search it. But that also sort of in lies the problem because you're going to be evolving into multiple Groviles anyway. You don't really need the Meganium too much until you're doing like rescue stretcher shenanigans to get more stuff back. So I think overall you may as well just thicken out your lines, have more ball search, those sorts of things, than go towards this sort of Meganium concept. Yeah, it's a really, really cool ability. It's a shame that we don't know the exact wording. Uh, I think this would be really, really strong if it was the old Ray Candy ruling, but we'll just have to wait and see. Next up we have Shaman. Uh, this is a 70 HP basic that has the ability Floral Heal. Once during your turn, you may heal 20 damage from your active Grass Pokemon. Uh, this isn't fantastic. It's similar to the uh, Manaphy that was in a top 32 Lapras Quagsire list uh, from this weekend. It's a nice um, sort of pseudo counter to things like spread decks. It means that important flying flips aren't, are, are negated. If you have a couple of these Shamans out, um, you can hopefully start healing through uh, and your active Pokemon that can start taking knockouts on Cocos. But at the same time, um, they're bench spa it, one, it's bench spaces, so it's not ideal. And two, in not too many archetypes, you want to be playing a Shaman just for a plus, for a heal 20, uh, because a lot of the time against anything that isn't spread, they're going to be doing like 140, 180, 190, big numbers where the 20 is going to be pretty irrelevant. So you're going to need to Ace Royal or a Max Potion anyway. So it's not ideal, but... Uh, it is a nice sort of effect. Maybe this is the kind of um, this is the kind of card that you could play in like that Vespicum deck we spoke about just a moment ago. It's just a nice, another nice, cool effect that maybe you can find a home for in some grass decks that really struggle with spread archetypes. On to Skip Plume and Jump Bluff. Some highly anticipated cards here. We've already mentioned Lost Mixer. This is going to be one of your two main attackers here. The Skip Bloom has the ability Flower Bridge. Once during a turn, you may search your deck for a Jump Bluff and switch it with this Pokemon. Place the Pokemon and all cards attached to it into the Lost Zone, then shuffle your deck. So the Skip Bloom and Hopip immediately jump into the Lost Zone. Jump Bluff becomes your new Pokemon, either on the active or the bench, depending on where you evolve from. And then essentially the Jump Bluff is a stage one, even though it reads as a stage two. The Jump Bluff has, for a Grass Energy, 20 times the amount of Pokemon in the Lost Zone, excluding Pokemon Prism Stars. So, the Skip Plume is an immediate 40 damage for you. 
we're going to try and ramp this up, this jump bluff, with trum beaks, lost mixers, and getting multiple skip plumes up. So we're envisioning, uh, envisioning the list to have lots of ball search, multiple ultra balls, net, uh, net balls, uh, maybe even some great balls or timer balls in there as well. I've seen a few Japanese lists playing timer balls. And essentially, for Lost March to be doing one hit KO shenanigans, we're looking to get uh, probably three skip blooms evolved up into jump bluffs. So that's 120 damage. Then you have your trum beaks that get on top of that. If you've got two or three trum beaks in the early game, that's going to be insane for you. And then the loss mixers start getting cream on top. Obviously, we do have choice band as well. So if you do get, you know, three, like we've seen with Malamar, right? You, it's pretty easy to get three stage one set up. Um, so it's realistic that Jump Pluff does get into one hit KOs fairly quickly. I think we're looking more towards turn three than turn two. But that's still a lot of good early pressure. The Jump Pluff also has a nice free retreat, which is worth noting, and the Skip Plume does, uh, does as well, so that's all good stuff. It has resistance to fighting, which can help you out here and there. I think my reluctance to call this a Tier 1 deck is that it does still carry a lot of weaknesses. Um, if your Hop Ips get knocked out before they come Skip Plumes, you're going to have to like stretch them back in, and that's a lot of wasted time for you. If you've prized Jump Pluffs, or if you've drawn into Jump Pluffs, it's really annoying because you can't use the Flower Bridge after a certain point. That could be... A certain headache for you. If you don't draw to Trum Beaks, that's going to be really annoying. If your loss mixers aren't hitting the right targets. Um, the fact that you all have really low hit points means you probably need to play Machoke. Um, the fact that you can lose to Shuckle without things like uh, Super Boost Energy or Muck is also really annoying. So we're going to be playing like 22 Pokemon, a bunch of Ball Search, and just hoping to get things in the right sequence. And that always makes me a little bit nervous, especially with the supporters that we have in the format right now. They're not too great. Um, so we really are relying heavily on hitting the right cards in the right order. And that's where my biggest concern comes with the Night March deck, let alone the fact that you have a really terrible matchup to the Giratina Coco spread stuff that's coming out as well. Yeah, I think in general, I've had a couple of people say to me that um, oh, it, it's like Night March, and it's not like Night March. It's similar to Night March, but it's not like Night March. By the end, it was just broken. It had so many tools that just kept on pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, and it's still a really, really good archetype, even in expanded. But the difference is fundamentally, the Lost Zone is a very, very different mechanic to the discard pile. You naturally put cards in the discard pile, and yes, we have cards like Lost Mixer, like Trumbeak, that will be putting cards into the lost zone but there is going to be fundamentally less than less of them night march already worked with ultra balls already worked with sycamore already worked with those kind of cards and then it also had battle compressor it but it if it just had battle compressor it would still be pretty good but at the same time it wouldn't have the consistency of ultra ball and sycamore as well and this doesn't have the ultra the consistency of ultra ball and sycamore because Yes, they search for pieces you want if you if you were to play them, but they wouldn't be boosting your damage. So it's very different to Night March. It's not. I don't think it's this is going to get as out of hand as Night March did because I think the mechanics are too different. That's not me saying I don't I don't have any information. I don't know. Maybe they'll like push lots of um, Losso mechanics. I like the Losso mechanic. I don't like this mechanic based around the Lost Zone, unfortunately, but I don't think it will be as problematic as um, Night March was in its heyday. So yeah, it's a really, really cool archetype, and I think it probably is like Tier 2, but it's never going to be as dominant and as oppressive as Night March once was, because fundamentally the effects are just not completely different, but too different. You can't really compare them as much as, as comparable as they look. Yeah, and the fact people need to like always play like 20 Pokemon means it'll never be turbo turbo like Night March used to be anyway. Yeah. Next up we have Shuckle GX. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a really, really cool card actually. Protective Pot uh, is its ability. You can prevent all damage done to this Pokemon by your opponent's, po uh, opponent's Pokemon with two energy or less, two or less energy attached to them. So things like Zoroark that are just attaching DCs, uh, they're not actually going to be able to do any damage to a Shuckle. Um, this is a really, really nice ability. Um, against m basically anything that doesn't have uh, sort of any energy acceleration. If you're able to just watch someone attach one energy and pass, uh, you can probably get away with things like Pumaria and Crushing Hammer, uh, forcing them to never have enough energy to uh, even do damage to a Shuckle. But anything with acceleration, things like the first thing that comes to mind is Malamar, things like Vika Ray, all of these 
decks that naturally attack for three energy plus have some imbue acceleration anyway they're just going to be able to run over shuckle so it, it can never really be i don't think we're in a format where it can never be a quad shuckle deck that just wins because there's too many uh archetypes that stop or, or that, that push being able to attach more energy so it's never going to be amazing but at the same time the ability is really really annoying one of one of these can just completely shut down a zorak deck sometimes which is pretty cool um I don't think it's crazy good. It's a nice strafe target as well, um, because it's just another annoyance for your opponent. But at the same time, it's not it's not fantastic. It's attacks. It is color. It is a completely colorless attacker though, so it's splashable. Uh, speaking of which, it, speaking of which, it's attacks. Uh, triple poison lets you poison your opponent's active, and you put three damage counters on instead of one. So with a couple of survivors, you can be doing fifty per turn, forcing them to move. Uh, is really, really nice, actually, for this kind of archetype because it means that they can't just stack energy on one Pokemon because you can just poison them or even wrap GX and paralyze them. Um, so they're like, well, I can't... If I Ace a Roller, I lose all my energy attachments. If I Guzma, I have to find a way of retreating back in. So, you know, it can be quite nice to be able to... It, like, it all kind of feels synergistic because you, your opponent isn't going to be wanting to leave the same thing in the active the whole time because it's just going to be uh, racking up the damage counters. Uh, but at the same time, there are too many archetypes out there that will just naturally have an answer to Shuckle for it to ever be Tier 1. Yeah, I think it's more a tech card than a deck in itself. I think something like a Zora Control deck might just splash this in because it has no other way to beat Lost March. Stuff like that is going to be where I think Shuckle will shine. I think it is great that its attacks are colorless. It means that it can be this tech card to splash in if you are struggling against these sorts of low-energy attaching matchups. Next up we have the non-GX Shuckle, which is also a very interesting and cool card. Its ability is Juice Extractor. Once during a turn, you, uh, when you play this card from your hand onto your bench, you may search your deck for up to three basic energy cards and discard them, shuffle your deck. So it's like a Battle Compressor exclusively for basic energy cards. This does have synergy with a few different things out there, things like Malamar, things like... Uh, turbo Metals that's never really kicked off. <laughs> and uh, things like Alolan Executor, uh, where you can get your 60 damage for free, basically, through a Shuckle, which is great. You can Netball for Shuckle as well, because it does go to hand, which is awesome. It does also have an attack, which is Energy Drink uh, for a Grass. You can attach two basic energy cards from your discard pile to your Pokemon in any way that you like. So Shuckle essentially sets himself up. You bench that Shuckle, get those energies in the bin, attach to it, and energy drink them onto your Pokemon on the bench. So that could also be used as a means of accelerating. I think it's mainly used for its ability. I personally don't think it will make the cut in Malamar, but I can see it being played in Alone and Executor and a few other archetypes here and there that aren't as um, reliant on the bench as something like a Malamar would be. Uh, simply for the fact that it was in that Alone and Executor Sceptile deck, we rated it a three star, but I think its versatility also warrants that for future purposes. Yeah. Next up, we have Celery Prism Star. Uh, this is one of the Prism Star Pokemon, which um, means that you can only have one of per deck, and it goes to the Lost Zone when it is knocked out. Uh, the notable attack on this card is Time Warp for a Colorless. You may choose any number of your evolved Pokemon in play and put the highest stage evolution of that card back into your hand. Um, the only synergies that we could really think of, one was the Toppling Wind Riperia, which uh, is a cool mill-style archetype, but, you know, it's a stage two, and it is, in, in almost all situations, I think, it's just, I think it's just better to have a basic with um, potentially more HP than Riperia that you can just naturally heal. Uh, you're not discarding anywhere near as many cards, but at the same time, you're also not dying so you know you're kind of still milling in a sense plus you're not as um sort of worried about judge about marshadow that kind of thing if you time warp all of these cool cards back into your hand they can just get judged away and you then have to find them all again which is pretty sad uh, the other one we thought of was obviously greninja gx that and the frogadier both have um sniping abilities but at the same time if you're getting say two greninjas and uh a frogadier back into your hand that's 80 damage worth of uh, extra snipes you get. Well, you can get the same by just attacking with pretty much any two energy attacker right now. It's probably going to be able to do around 80 damage. Um, yes, this is a one prize attacker, but it's a one of and also can be like the you you don't front load the damage. You 
have have retroactive damage, which is fine if you want to spread the damage elsewhere and you don't necessarily waste damage. But at the same time, it means sometimes you don't get the damage anyway. So yeah, it's a cool effect, but it's never quite going to be good enough just because things like Judge will just mean it does nothing for you. It actually makes your deck more inconsistent rather than uh, making your game plan more consistent. Yeah, and this is just overall very, very slow. Next up, we have Dustox and Beautifly. We're mainly talking about these cards because of the Silcoon and Cascoon, which both share the Gathering of Cocoons attack for a colorless. Uh, you get to search your deck for up to four in combination of Silcoon and Cascoon and put them onto your bench and shuffle your deck afterwards. So it's OP, OP water duplicates. That's pretty much the concept here. Instead of getting three Frogadiers, you can get four Silcoons and Cascoons. Unfortunately, Dustox and Beautifly both suck. I'm not even going to talk about them really. You can pause if you want to look at them. The idea would be to paralyze with Dustox to stall, let Shrine tick damage whilst you're sniping and trying to take knockouts with Beautifly and receive uh, or sort of get around damage as well. But I think there's just so many much better Shrine decks out there. This is really just a nod to the Silcoon and Cascoon if we ever get better ones in the future. Next up, we have Verizion GX. Uh, this is kind of reminiscent of the old... Um... Leaf Wallop Verizion, which also had double draw. Um, this is a 170 HP uh, GX Pokemon, again, with f uh, fire weakness, sorry, not fighting, um, which in general isn't great looking at the set. But that being said, um, it does have some cool attacks. Double draw for a colorless, draws two cards. Uh, nothing exciting, but it is a splashable draw engine if you really, really desire one. Sensitive Blade for Grass Grass does 50 damage, and if you play a support card this turn, uh, this attack does 80 more damage, so that's 130, uh, 150 with a Lorantis, 180 with a Choice Band. Again, a fantastic number to be hitting. At the same time, you can also play Aether pa Paradise Conservation Area to give yourself that extra bit of bulk, uh, meaning that sometimes you can perhaps even tank a hit uh, against some of these bigger mons, which is really, really cool. That being said, it's very difficult to attach to energy to uh, this attacker right now. You kind of have to play Lorantis GX with it. And I think in general, Lorantis GX is probably going to be doing more con more consistently a higher amount of damage anyway. Plus, you have a Lorantis engine uh, where you can play Sunny Day anyway. So, in general, if you're playing Lorantis to set up Verizions, I think you're probably just better off setting up more Lorantises. Um, so, double draw is essentially the only reason you're running this card. And you're running a draw engine on a two prize Pokemon in a Fire Week format. So, it doesn't sound great. Uh, its GX tag is really cool, though. Breeze Away for a colorless lets you put any number of your Pokemon in play and all cards attached to it. And all cards attach them into your hand. Um, so initially, you're like, oh, cool, we can get Lele's, Marshadows back. That's really, really nice. Um, and that is true. You can get some of these cool uh, from hand effects coming back into your hand. Plus, you can also, it, like, it's kind of pseudo max potion as well. You can heal your Pokemon. Uh, you can maybe present a board where you just have non EXs out and um, your opponent can't win the game next turn. That kind of thing is pretty cool. Uh, but then, then we had a thought. We had. We, we thought, well, Breeze Away puts cards into your hand. Double draw draws cards. What if we just Breeze Away, like, Lorantises with choice bands and Verizions with choice bands, and all of a sudden we get and we just leave two unknown hands out? Maybe you can reach 35 cards in your hand by picking up, drawing, it's essentially draw 12 cards, which for unknown hand dot deck, that could be pretty cool. Um, however, <laughs> this isn't probably going to work. Maybe this is seen as a one-of. Um, because it was it is all colorless, which is nice. Um, but that's probably the, one of the one of the better uses for the GX attack. Uh, one of the more meme uses as well. In general, just because this attacker doesn't have uh, acceleration, it doesn't sort of, it sort of falls short of being able to be set up consistently. Um, but there is definitely some really really cool stuff you can do. And the the breeze away hand thing was something Joe mentioned to me earlier on. And <laughs> my jaw just dropped. It was great. I mean, I'm definitely gonna try it with the unknown hand because I'm gonna try like a Zoro build. Uh, I mean, we'll talk about unknown hand later. But essentially, having like two Verizion just to be double drawing throughout the game and then have breeze away that puts like the rest of your board that you use to get 35 cards you just put them all in your hand and you go all in and just say do you have a judge this turn <laughs> that's pretty much the concept behind this which just made me laugh so much i think it's like a real turbo way of getting a bunch of cards in your hand after um you know building the board to draw lots throughout the game you can just breeze away and just leave those unknowns there for you to win the next turn i think that's really cool but uh yeah the Rizian 
unfortunately no energy acceleration for it right now so sensitive blade although it is good damage output a lot of the time you can't really chain it that often so um but yeah that breeze away gx attack very very strong because it's colorless so there's a lot of applications here for healing and stuff like that especially important right now that there's like shrine shenanigans going on you can completely like remove a wing condition from people if you just go for a breeze away after like five turns of them thinking that shrine's ticking over and everything's happening like i've seen tapu cure work against spread decks that remove like 200 or so damage and it sets that sets back their sort of lele or necrozma turn you can do it like way better with a verizian gx but you have to almost like reset your board state as well so kind of riskier but also a great way to get around these sorts of archetypes next up we have mag cargo gx we have already mentioned this card Again, it does look to have a lot of potential. Its ability is Crush Charge. Once during a turn, you may discard the top card from your deck. If that card is a basic energy card, attach it to one of your Pokemon. It doesn't specify fire, but um, its attacks are fire costed. So uh, Lava Flow does 50, and you may discard any number of basic uh, energy cards from this Pokemon. It does 50 more for each card you discarded so if you discard the three which are the requisite you're doing 200 230 with a choice band is obviously a very nice number um, but you also have the versatility of being able to discard as many as you need so you're never really overkilling non-gx's and stuff like that if you have multiple of your mag cargos set up you're hopefully going to be crush charging hitting these basic energies thanks to the other mag cargo that you'll be playing the smoother the mag cargo to make a pretty nice engine for getting these attachments rolling um, I think the downside of this is that you need to basically have a real Exodia style board state where you have two baby mag cargos and two mag cargo GXs set up. Yes, we do have Ditto Prism Star to make it a little bit easier, but we're still asking for a lot here. And usually your first one or two smooth overs are going to have to be for like supporter cards or finding the mag cargo GXs themselves to get set up. So then your first one or two crush charges are just random chance. You're just hoping that you hit an energy card to get acceleration. And if you don't, you're going to be really, really slow, to be honest. I think having a Victini Prism to sort of reset all these energies after a bunch of Lava Flows could be a good way to keep you in the game. Uh, but I think overall, it's going to be really difficult for you to chain Lava Flows enough to be a consistent deck overall as attackers, especially if your opponent starts just dealing with the non-GX Mag Cargos after you've done a big Lava Flow knockout. It's going to be really awkward for you to keep up that sort of tempo. I think one final note for this card is that you do have the Magma Burn GX attack. Discarding the top five cards of your opponent's deck. We do have Houndoom EX in Expanded, which is obviously also using that fire cost and trying to mill as well. I think this is similar to the Charizard GX um, attack, but it's just way more realistic to get going and mill. So that's something to bear in mind. You could get a lot of cards out of your opponent's deck now with just one attachment as well. So really realistic for that option. And I think if you're going to be playing a mill deck anyway... It's not a bad thing just, just to have like two smooth over mag cargos and then one mag cargo GX in there to finish off the game. So that's going to be an interesting adaptation for those in Expanded. Yeah, it's a cool effect. It's just a shame that um, like it just doesn't, it's, it's just slightly out of tilt, which is really unfortunate. Worth noting, we also get another Slugma, which is pretty cool. Um, there's no Slugmas that are currently 60 HP, so it means that Elm can never find Slugma, which is sad. Uh, but so now this one becomes the best one because it has more HP. Uh, but yeah, other than that, my cargo is pretty cool, but I think has been slightly underwhelming overall in our thought process. Next up, we have Blacephalon. This has not at all been underwhelming. This, I think, is one of my, another of my favorite cards of the set. 180 HP Fire type, uh, Ultra Beast. So it has all of the cool Ultra Beast synergies. As you can see, Ultra Space, Beast Energy, and Beast Ring all work with this guy, which is really, really strong. Three attacks, Bursting Burn for a single fire, uh, burns and confuses the opponent's active. This is deceptively good uh, because you're doing a base 20 with the burn now, which is pretty cool. means early game you're not doing absolutely nothing. Uh, forces Guzmas, forces Acer Rollers, forces Switch Cards, just uh, all forces people to play into confusion and sometimes miss attacks as well as deal 30 to themselves. So it's a nice effect of an attack to have. And then Mind Blown for two Fire, uh, fire energy is the same as Lost Burn from Magnazone Prime, which was obviously absolutely busted. Uh, that did have Magnetic Draw, which was another reason why it was busted, but still the attack was crazy good. And this is on a basic. It does 50 damage, and you may put as many of your fire energy attached to your Pokemon in general into the Lost Zone. For each fire you put in there, this attack does 50 damage. So 
Um, we have the new Naganadel, which lets you attach energy from the discard pile to it, so you can discard your fires early with things like Acrobike, uh, that Heat Factory Prism Star, all of this good stuff, Ultra Balls. You then attach them all back to your Naganadel, and then you mind blown energy each turn to guarantee a knockout. Um, on a one uh, on a basic Pokemon, uh, it's just crazy good. In the mid game, you can Beast Ring for a boost of energy. Early game, you can Kiawe. You have Beast Energy plus Choice Band to do to be doing a base 60 anyway. Uh, like this, the deck just sounds so crazy good. It's bonkers. On top of that, the uh, GX Attack Burst GX is even. It's just so clown. This whole card is so clown. Um, for one Fire Energy, you discard one of your prize cards. Uh, and if it's a, if it's an energy card, you can attach it to one of your Pokemon. Um, so yeah, you, not only is it draw, taking a prize, but sometimes it's boosting your damage for Mind Blown as well. Uh, but it also has the caveat of if you have one prize left, you win the game. So you only need to take five prizes with this guy. Uh, so it can be an early game extra acceleration attack, or it can be a late game win condition. Um, this card just has everything. It's such a strong archetype. We've seen it do really, really well in Japan. Uh, it won both seniors and juniors events in um, their, like, I think it was Tokyo uh, National Championship, which was really, like, it was such a huge showing for the deck. It also came second in the Masters as well. So in general, we've seen the results from this deck, and we can't really deny that it's not going to uh, do well in this format as well. I think it's, out of the gate, one of the best archetypes from the set and looks to be potentially even tier one. It's crazy how strong this whole package is with Naganadel plus Bacephalon. Yeah, uh, Omnipoke's found ourselves a new mascot, which is great, and the card is absolutely ridiculous. I think the fact that the basically the whole deck can be uh, sort of obtained from this set as well is going to be amazing. You just need to get your hands on Beast Rings and Beast Energy and everything else you can get from this set. So that's really awesome as well. It just comes out the box, swinging hard, and yeah, big one-hit knockouts is just really good in the format. And water weakness isn't a huge problem right now because A, there's the grass stuff to sort of keep them at bay and B, the water archetypes aren't like that strong at the moment, just competing with the other decks. Although, you know, we here love Lapras Quag, but that's just a drop in the ocean, really. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Victini. Uh, we actually didn't do a community rating for this because I sort of snuck it on late in the day, but it does have this V-beat attack for a... Fire Colorless, and it does 20 times the number of your uh, basic Pokemon on the bench. Um, oh, sorry, just uh, basic Pokemon, not even on the bench. That's broken. It includes itself. Um, so, yeah, it's only really um, going to be used as a counter energy card, I think, in most situations in standard. Um, there's only a handful of decks that can use this with no evolutions at all. Uh, thinking about things like the Persimian Coco deck or the Larvitar Coco deck, things like these, maybe trying to abuse counter energy. Vitini does hit a good type coverage for these sorts of effects, especially if Sceptile is going to be promising and prominent. So that is something to keep an eye out for. The only other thing we can think about is in Expanded, where there's a lot more help for fire stuff. Vitini gets into ridiculous damage if you have Steam Up or Skyfield it'll be getting one-hit KOs all the time. So this could actually be a real threat in Expanded, so keep an eye out for that as well. Yeah, it's a cool counter-energy card, but not much more. Next up, we have the water types. King things off with Mantine. Uh, Mantine Surf is its ability. If this Pokemon has any energy attached to it, this Pokemon has no retreat cost. Um, it's a nice pivot, but we have Coco, we have Switch Boy for water types, uh, we have Switch in general, we have Acerola, we have Guzma, we have a lot of different switching archetypes right now um we don't necessarily need it plus with quagsire in general it doesn't matter uh what you put active because you can always put your attacker active because you can just wash out to the active anyway so it's a cool ability but right now it's not necessary for water decks yeah i think the only thing it would be is a follow-up after volt prism star because it does have that fighting resist that's really the yeah. only note i took from the card but it probably won't deserve the slot next up we have a non-GX Lapras with the ability Swimming. Once during a turn, you will look at the top two cards of your deck and return them to the top of your deck in any order. Honestly, I think this just isn't a strong enough effect on its own. Its attack isn't relevant enough. And if you're going to be a basic bench sitter, you have to compete with a Ranguru. And that, in general, I think is going to be a much more viable ability most of the time. Yeah. Next up, we have Baby Suicune. 
Uh, its ability frozen current once during your turn. If this Pokemon is your active Pokemon, you may have your opponent switch their active as one of their benched. Uh, in general, it's repel on an ability, but you have to be active. Uh, the attack isn't great, so you don't really want to be attacking with this guy. Um, plus, grass is getting better, so this probably isn't seeing much play anyway. Uh, plus, we have Volcanion, which essentially does the same thing, but can sit on your bench, is a good attacker, has 160 HP, isn't weak to grass, and also has Aqua Patch Synergy, so it's just outclassed pretty much wholeheartedly by Volcanion Prism Star. On to the Suicune GX, which has a bit more promise to it. It's a 180 hit point basic with the ability Phantom Wins. Once during a turn, if this Pokemon is on your bench, you may shuffle it and all cards attached into your deck. So, basically, it's a means of healing itself, or it's a means of just clearing your bench space for you, which is cool. Um, it's obviously searchable via Brooklyn Hill, which is nice, and I can see this being a one-off in Lapras Quagsire, um, because you do have that washout. So, if you're attacking with Suicune, you tank a hit, you Guzma something else up, or just, again, use a Switch card or whatever, and then you wash out all the energy that was on that Suicune onto a new attacker, even a, a second Suicune, for example, and then you just Phantom Wins back into the deck, tap that Brooklet Hill, get it back down, and you've done a free Max Potion, basically. It's really nice. Max Potion was a card we kind of want as like a 65th card or something in Lapras Quagsire. <laughs> yeah. So having this tech Pokemon as an option could be a great way to get around decks that don't typically get one-hit KOs. Its attacks aren't too shabby either. Cure Stream does 120, and during your opponent's next turn, the defending Pokemon's attacks do 30 less. So again, it just combines really nicely with that Phantom Wins, um, because you're going to make yourself that little bit more tanky and difficult to knock out in the first place. And we do have uh, Brinicles GX, I want to say. Uh, <laughs> for two water and a colorless, it does 150. Switch this Pokemon with one of your bench. It's the same as uh, Golisopod's GX attack, but for a slightly different cost. Obviously, we have Aqua Patch, so it's pretty much just as effective. Um, and again, you're moving to the bench, so you can then do wash out Phantom Wind shenanigans. So... Uh, if you don't have the Guzma or the Switch card on that turn, you can still do it and threaten the Phantom Wins anyway. So it also does good numbers as well. Uh, if you haven't done, if, if you haven't had the chance to use your Volk Prism Star for spreads, or if they put down a Lele late in the game, you can Choice Band and Brinicles GX. One great thing about the Lapras deck is it's really yearning for a good GX attack. It doesn't really have one right now, so it can just instantly go in as a one of and join the crew uh, because I think it's good enough. Yeah, I, I I want this card to be good. I really do. But unfortunately, I think just in general with grass getting better, it's yeah. it's just the wrong time. Oh, well. Next up, we have Primarina, which is, it has a really, really cool ability, Harmonix. When you attach an energy from your hand to one of your Pokemon, you may attach up to two energy instead. So this is the same as the ancient trait on Primal Kyogre and a couple of other things back from Primal Clash, which let you uh, double attach per turn. The ability in itself is really, really cool. Um, and actually synergizes well with the Primarina GX uh, because Bubble Beat does more damage based on the amount of water energy on your board. So you're actually plusing or adding 40 every time you attach. Uh, but this is a stage 2 archetype that one is weak to grass and two is a stage 2 archetype. Um, so just in general isn't going to see play. Uh, but the ability is super cool and it's nice to see them finding ways to use these ancient traits which I think were one of the cooler mechanics uh, in different ways this time. Next up we have Zeb Striker. It's a pretty exciting lightning type card with the ability Fast Break. Once during a turn, you may discard your hand, then draw four. Very, very um, crazy ability. I think it's a great way to just burn your hand and get four more. It's like a Sycamore Light, I guess, where you're just getting rid of everything and seeing four fresh cards. Uh, a lot of people will harp back to the artillery that we've just lost in rotation. Also compare it somewhat to the Instructor Rangaroo. This is obviously useful every turn, because at any time you can just be like, well, I don't want any of these cards, get rid of them, and get cycling. I think it's very aggressive draw. Obviously has great synergy which which um, with decks sorry that uh, love having cards discarded. Rotom's getting rid of tools, Vespicom getting rid of excess Pokemon. That's all going to be groovy for you. If you want to use a Zeb Striker like, frequently throughout the game, I think you're going to have to slightly adapt your deck to playing one or two pal pads, one or two rescue stretches as well, so that you're not just so concerned about losing that precious Guzma or whatever else. You can keep recycling your deck with these pal pads and stretchers whilst going cycling heavily via this ability. I think one great thing about this is that we have Ditto Prism Star. There's going to be a lot of evolution decks that can think about having one of these in there just because it's such little commitment when you have Ditto. It's literally one card that you could add into your deck to give you some more aggressive cycle. 
I think one thing to be aware of is that Octillery was not only very good for its own ability itself, it was very good because Brooklet Hill is a busted card and it gets your Remoraids out guaranteed turn one. And that's not going to be the case for this Zeb Striker. Although we do have Elm, which can get you Ditto or Blitzel, um, I think it was just so easy to get your Octillery going in those decks that it was just a no-brainer to put it in. Whereas the Zeb Striker does have some teething issues in the early game. If you don't see it early, it's going to be annoying. There are certain hands where you don't want to dump, you want to hold certain cards. So I don't think it's perfect, but definitely comparable to these cards. And they've always found a home at some point in the game. Yeah. Oh, sorry. My mic is breaking up at the moment. But yeah, I was talking to Joe about Zeb Striker earlier on. And it's, I think it's so good for the format. And the fact that it's come out with Ditto in the same set is really, really strong. But at the same time, Octillery didn't initially see a huge amount of play. Now, the format was very different. Um, and Octillery just got like exponentially better. Um, but I, and I think that's kind of what Zeb Strike is going to do. It feels like it's a really, really strong card that doesn't immediately fit into anything, obviously, but will is it's like its ability is so strong inherently it will be good at some point, especially with the the lack of supporters we have right now. Um, like we we rated Sightseer, which is essentially a similar supporter at a four star. Um, so you know, just in general, uh, it, its ability is so strong it will be good at some point. Uh, but I think I, I just can't see where it goes right now. It probably has to be in like a ditto, not box, but in something that's already playing ditto for an immediate effect. But I think anything, like if we ever see a stadium similar to um, Brooklet for lightning types, like this is just obviously just gets so good. So yeah, it's a good card to have and will be good at some point. I just can't pinpoint where yet, but I'm really, really glad we have it. It's actually... Loki, one of the I think one of the best cards in the set that people are just kind of glancing over because Lost March and Belacephalon are in the set. Well, just support Pokemon in general are so important to have. Next up, we have Zorora GX, uh, which is a really, really sort of strong archetype to be pushing. I really, really like this card. It's a combination of three fantastic cards in the past. Uh, Darkrai EX was basically dominant for its whole time its whole life while it was in the format uh, it started to peter off right near the end of um sort of when it was released but that's because in general fighting types got good but its ability was always fantastic whenever it was out so it's got thunderclap zone which means that all of your lightning types have free retreat or all of your pokemon with lightning energy sorry have free retreat uh, incredibly versatile we have plasma fists uh, which is the same as lapras and uh, buzzwalls attack Three for 160, and this Pokemon can't attack next turn. We have so many switching cards. We have Guzma, we have Acerola, uh, we have all of these all of these switching cards. Um, plus, the Thunderclap Zone gives everything through retreat anyway, so you can just bounce between two Zororas. Um, so it it doesn't even matter about the text underneath this, which is really really strong. And 160 for three is obviously really really good. You can push it to 190, like I say, uh, with electric power or even higher if you want. Uh, with more more powers or choice bands plus we have thunder mountain meaning that you can actually attack turn two like joe said uh with plasma fists which is just crazy good turn two 160 potentially 190 um pretty much always guaranteeing a knockout is just stupid and then finally we have full voltage gx uh which is uh, similar to nitro tank it lets you attach five energy from your discard pile to uh, five lightning energy from your discard pile i think it's basic actually it's yeah, any, five yeah. basic energy from your discard pile to your Pokemon, uh, which is just really, really good acceleration. If things aren't going well in the early game, you can just build a board and be able to Plasma Fists from there every turn. Or in the late game, you can build a board where your opponent can't take out both Zororas, so you're guaranteed to um, take two prizes with one of them uh, during your last turn of the game. So it's a combination of three cards that have all not dominated. Yeah, we're pretty much dominated. It's the, the Lapras is throwing me off, Joe. Um <laughs> The, they've all dominated at some point. I'm talking about Buzzwell, not Lapras, of course. It's just a combination of three fantastic cards, which means it's kind of inherently going to be good. Uh, the big, big downside is it is weak to fighting. But the fact that we have electric power means you can actually play weakness policy with this card and still hit 190, which is kind of uh, the big number to be hitting right now. You can even push higher than that, like I say, uh, with more electric powers. So whilst the weakness is a big issue... Uh, we have ways around it, which is really, really cool. Uh, one final note is, it, or a couple of final notes. The first is, in 
decks that are playing Vika Vault, you can basically have this as a bench sitter, and all of your deck has free retreat now. Uh, one of the biggest things with Vika Ray was you kind of everything was everything was chunky. Whilst you had acceleration, you didn't want to be paying retreat uh, because like you, you were just wasting damage at that point. So now everything having free retreat basically means the deck is a little bit more consistent. Uh, plus you have a nice sort of uh, one energy or three energy attacker, I guess, but one one like one attacker that doesn't need a lot of energy on the board that still does a huge chunk of damage. Uh, Zorora is never going to be like winning you six prizes, but it can be a nice if if they've dealt with all of your requires. It can be a nice sort of attacker out of nowhere, which is cool. And finally, with things like EXP Share Tapu Koko, you can actually get a really really cool sort of Tapu Koko Acerola cycling deck now. Um, this this card hasn't seen play since it was first released, even though I think it is a really strong card. Um, the GX attack is really, really cool, and just being able to cycle so much better with this card I think probably means that it has to be reconsidered um, with Thunder Mountain plus the electric power plus giving everything free retreat and a good GX attack and a strong attack in Plasma Fists. Um, there's there's no way this card can't be good at some point, even with Fighting Weakness. It's just too, There's just too many good points about this card to ever say it's bad yeah i mean it's literally mashed the three best parts of three excellent cards all into one and it has 190 hit points it's absolutely insane uh i want to try this in as you said the turbo coco i think it's instantly put in a one of in vika ray i also want to try out sort of a turbo ray almost like a world style but now we have like sightseers we have acro bikes you go for a turn one voltage gx alongside a bunch of stormy winds. Voltage GX is great because, as Jack said, it's not just lightning energy you can get back. You can also get back grass energies. So if you just cycle hard, try and find your Rayquazas, get, like, two or three of those down turn one, and then full voltage to end your turn, you can, like, free retreat out of your Zerora and then just have Rayquazas plus Wishful Batons or EXP shares to retain that damage. I think that sounds really dangerous. Uh, again, you have, like, one Thunder Mountain that you throw in the deck because why not? You just get a free... Two energy attack with a Zerora, which is ridiculous. Uh, I think that could really work well, and it's literally just the fact that the energy, or sorry, the lightning power card. I can't remember what it's called. Electric power. That card is so ridiculous that, as you said, Coco, which has never seen play really, uh, just gets put so much because its damage output just launches into the heavens. It's ridiculous, and Zerora is just so good. I, I, whenever I look at the card, I just feel happy because it's ridiculously good. <laughs> And it's depressing that fighting is going to remain so powerful and dangerous, but Zerora, I think similar to Zoroark, is so good that it'll still see play anyway. Yeah, I think so. Next up we have Giratina, hopefully one of the things that can keep fighting at bay to allow Zerora into the format. Uh, it's a 130 hit point basic psychic type with an insane ability called Torn Door. Once during your turn, you, if this Pokemon is in your discard pile, you may put it onto your bench. Then... Put one damage counter on two of your opponent's bench Pokemon. So, before you're even considering the damage counters that you're putting on the bench for your opponent, its own ability means that you have infinite attackers and you have access to Giratina basically all game, which is insane. It's also just ridiculous because it becomes essentially like a free, almost like um, the executes that we used to see it's a free discard for ultra ball or mysterious treasure because you'll be like oh i just bin this and then tina straight back onto the board it's just ridiculous that you get some freebie search in your deck essentially whilst also getting these two damage counters which is really going to synergize well with the kind of deck that we're going to try and construct here because we're going to be pairing it with the annoying cards of shrine of punishment and tapu coco and it's going to really work out well because you can choose these uh counters to push like 70 hit point Pokemon into that 60 zone where flying flips can get them in range. Stuff like that is going to be really cute for you for math fixing. I think the fact that this can be hit with a spell tag as well on top for additional counter placements here and there just makes it a real headache for the opponent to deal with. It does have the shadow impact attack for two psychic and a colorless, which is 130, and you have to put four counters on one of your Pokemon. You can choose to put it on yourself, or you can choose to put it on just like a random Malamar. I think that da those damage counters are only annoying in mirror match situations. Um, in every other situation, it's absolutely fine. This guy has resistance to fighting as well, so he pretty much goes straight in over the Shining Lugia that we used to see in Mali, because this just has a much better ability, which means you never run out of attackers, and you get free damage counters whenever it gets knocked out. And... Uh, 
yeah, it does better damage, hits for more relevant weaknesses, like against Buzzwall, has that resist uh, resistance on top. It just fits so neatly into Mali Shrine that I think it pushes the archetype into top tier. Yeah, it's and it's done well in Japan. We've seen it do well in Japan. Uh, I think this is another of my favorite cards in the set. It's got so many good qualities about it. Like the it, there's, there's just, again, no way. I don't think Mali Shrine or Mali Spread doesn't do well next format. Next up, we have Sigalith. This is actually a really, really interesting card. Uh, it's a 170 HP GX with the ability Mirror Counter. If this is your active Pokemon, it gets damaged by the attack uh, from an opponent's EX or GX. You put damage counters on the attacking Pokemon equal to the amount of damage uh, the attack did to this Pokemon. So it's, it's, it's a really, really interesting ability and actually can be quite threatening in certain situations. Uh, but there's so many non-EX archetypes right now and it looks like there's going to be uh, more coming with the set as well. There's a lot of, uh, in general, there's a lot of attackers that will be able to play around this. It's not, it's like playing around a baby Hooper. People are, aren't already teching for it, but can tech for it. A lot of archetypes right now have an answer to it. Plus things like Buzz Garb Shrine, Buzz Rock, uh, Malamar. A lot of these decks already are playing non-EX attackers anyway. Um, so there, there are always going to be answers to Mirror Counter. Um, there will be certain situations where, like, you, you just play a Siglyph down and your opponent can't do little, like, too, you can't do a small enough amount of damage where they're not getting knocked out themselves. But I think it's so rare. Um, there's there's too many situations right now where it's just not ever going to be good enough. The attacks aren't great. Um, and things, like I say, Baby Buzzwall, Coco, um, even, like, the Giratina we've just talked about, all of these cards are technically counter this card right now just because they're being played um fundamentally it comes down to the fact that sigilith is in a format with shrine and everyone is playing shrine to which means they're playing non-ex attackers and therefore Siglyph, sigilith's ability essentially does nothing so it's a really really cool ability and i think in a different format could have been crazy good could have been super threatening but just because it shares a format with like shrine baby buzzwall coco those kind of things uh, it's never going to see too much of an impact i don't think yeah i have to agree with all that a quick note is that we did yo-yo like quite a lot on the rating for this card because you initially see that ability you think it's bonkers and then you try and build a list and you think about its own damage output it becomes less and less threatening so we think it'll be on the fringes next up we have cofagrigus it has the soul juggling attack for psychic colorless it does 10 and discard as many of your bench pokemon as you like 30 more damage for each bench you discarded in this way it also has that nice fighting resistance, minus 20, and 120 hit points on a stage one isn't too bad. Again, you can try and use these sort of spell tags and Giratina shenanigans to try and up your damage output by sniping the bench a bunch of times with your Tinas, then throwing them off the board with Cofagrigus and using a bunch of like stretchers to get those Tinas back to try and spam. It would be a kind of cute combo, but I think nothing more than cute. I think the fact that its cost is Psychic plus Colorless is really annoying. You have to use either Counter Energy or Counter gain uh, you do have d valley and expanded um, but i think the damage output just isn't quite perfect because you always need to keep one or two yamasks on your bench at the same time and uh, it's just gonna be really irritating for you a lot of the time i think we have seen despair ray work in the past but part of the reason guardy worked was because it was tanky in its own right and it did have its own energy acceleration the cofagrigus however doesn't have either of those things unfortunately no pretended to the throne Next up, we have Natu, which is another piece of the Lost March puzzle. Uh, for DCE, it also has Lost Part. Lost March, which does 20 damage times another Pokemon in your Lost Zone. So this is kind of um, another. It's another of these attackers that is going to be um, you're you're going to be trying to win the game, trying to trade up. Um, there's not much more to say about the Lost Zone, the Lost March mechanic. Uh, Trumpy has a little bit more about it, but just in general, this is the DCE attacker. This is like the Joltic part of the combo. Um, it's just another attacker for the deck. The deck will probably remain tier 2 uh, for now, and this is an integral piece to the deck. It is a really good type coverage to have. Having Grass and Psychic type coverage are two very good coverages to have, so that's one good mm -hmm. thing about the Natu. Yeah. Next up we have Espeon. Um, obviously we do have the Energy Evolution Eevee, so it's quite easy to get this Stage 1 into play, and it shares an attack with an old Leafeon, which was both one of mine and Jack's favourite cards way back when. Its first attack, however, is Allure, which lets you draw three. Its second attack is Energy Crush for a Psychic. You do 20, 
20 more damage times the amount of energy attached to all your opponent's Pokemon. I think right now, obviously, um, Espeon isn't going to be played in any deck outside of something like Espeon GX Garbodor. And I think if you're looking for a non-GX attacker, you've got Trash Lancer already, so there's no real reason to be playing Energy Crush. I think it's only really going to be good against things like uh, Rayquaza Vikavolt, stuff like that. Um, just in case your Trash Lancer isn't up and running. So I think maybe there's a call to play like a heavier non-GX build of Espeon Garb and just use like one or two GXs with like more spell tag focused. But I think it's too reliant on what your opponent does. And a lot of the time your Energy Crush just isn't going to be doing as much as you'd hope. Next up, we have the first of the three unknowns, uh, which is <laughs> these these three cards are probably the three most interesting cards in the set. Actually, we have unknown damage. Uh, once during your turn, if this Pokemon is your active Pokemon and your benched Pokemon have a combined total of at least sixty six damage counters between them, you may choose to win the game. Um, so sixty six damage counters is uh, it, it's not it's not a small amount. It's actually more than you'd think. Um, it's there, There's ways to do it, but in general, <laughs> it's pretty tough. Uh, in standard, at least, it looks like you're going to have to run like a kind of Rule of Evil-style deck where you're dealing damage to yourself over and over again and then uh, eventually just dropping down the unknown damage uh, in the late game. The big issue with that is, fundamentally, you have to Rule of Evil and put damage counters on yourself. So if your opponent is playing uh, any Guzmas or any Cocos or any any of these already good cards, they're probably also trying to accelerate your win condition, but at the same time accelerating their own to the point where they're just going to take six prizes in a turn. Um, so it, in standard, it's really, really difficult to pull this off. However, in expanded, this card I think is almost certainly going to be perma, but, uh, like Instaband, uh, because it's just broken. There's a, there's a couple of combos you can do. You can get... Um, some cool Archie, Archie Stoys stuff with Blastoise, um, like Frozen Cities and just attaching loads of energies to Waylords. Uh, but the big, big broken one, which can happen technically from turn two, um, is a pretty convoluted combo. You have a Weavile on the bench, you have two Waylords on the bench, you have a Reuniclus on the bench, and you have a bench space for um, Clefkey from Steam Siege. Uh, Weavile lets you attach, uh, reattach, or pick up a tool from your hand as often as you uh, pick up a tool from your Pokemon and put it into your hand as often as you like per turn. Um, Reunicus lets you replace damage, and obviously Waylord has a huge amount of HP. If you have a Magma Base out, you drop the Clefki, you move the two damage from the Magma Base onto a Waylord, you then attach the Clefki as a tool, and then put it back into your hand. Uh, you rinse, repeat, you can do this from turn two if you, if you find a ultimate combo of... Um, Candy Reuniclus plus Stage 1 plus two other Pokemon plus a um, Stadium plus uh, a Klefki plus your unknown damage. So you can technically, it's a lot of combo pieces, but you can do it from turn one, uh, turn two, sorry. Um, but the fact that this combo exists means that you this card will probably be insta banned just because it's not interactive at all. If they get this combo, they win the game. And because it can be done from turn one, turn two, sorry. Um, it's it's just crazy. It's it's kind of stupid. It's a really really cool effect, and um, in a format like expanded or unlimited, it's kind of not designed to be broken, but will be broken just based on uh, how many cards it, are in the pool. Um, but in standard, it's not. I don't think it's really going to see any play at all. In expanded, though, like I say, I wouldn't be surprised if some kind of errata or ban. Uh, was put on this just to stop. I don't think the deck is particularly good, but it's just so uninteractive. It's not the kind of archetype they want to be pushing, I don't think. Yeah, definitely bad in standard, and that's all we're really looking at here, but could be pretty fun for some early highlight reel memes in the early few days on the ladder uh, in expanded. <laughs> Next up, we have Unknown Hand. This is the one promising one of the three that we think may have a slight glimmer of hope in standard. We've already mentioned Whitney, how if you get three Whitneys in the bin and have one Whitney left, you can draw seven cards. Uh, you've got that Verizian, which can pick up your board and get you a bunch more cards in hand. The combos that we're thinking of are using things like Collect Lapras and Swampert to power draw plus Collect at the end of your turn until you get to 35. Uh, or you can go for a Zoroark plus Mount Coronet and Metal Energy Engine with Naganadel. So the Mount Coronet recovers all these... Uh, metal energies that you trade away each turn. Naganadol can attach them to itself. 
Um, and then you can use something like a Serrano to pick up your Naganadel, and then you get a bunch of cards back in your hand. Uh, or you can use that Verizium to get those cards back in your hand. So that's going to be the loop that you try and do. Have a bunch of... Because getting 35 cards in your hand doesn't just mean play a bunch of cycle, because then your discard pile gets too big. You need to have a way of looping your cards a bunch. So the Mount Coronet plus Trade Loop is getting you into more cards without actually paying a cost a lot of the time. That's pretty much the struggle that a lot of things are going to worry about. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people talking about putting one unknown hand in just any mill deck, like a Sylveon deck or a Steelix Warlord deck, and I don't think that's viable because oftentimes the mill deck has to play too many cards for that to work, and it just becomes useless. Um, so I think you really do need to try and just have a turbo cycle deck and be able to recover these sorts of cards with, um, like I said, the Mount Coronet or other stuff like that and use that for Rizian on the turn that you just hope your opponent doesn't have Judge or Marshadow. At the moment, counts are like one or two Judge maximum in like Zoroark decks. Uh, sometimes a Marshadow in certain builds like Malamar and stuff and Rayquaza, but it seems to be a low count, okay? And if you can get around one or two Judges... Um, and threaten that many cards in your hand like twice in the game, it's going to be pretty crazy. Um, what I love about the Zoroark build is you can actually attack as well. You can put pressure on the opponent by attaching and Rata's beating and then Ace of Rotoring and keeping a real game plan going. Uh, I think if you're playing a Lapras build, you're basically just a punching bag and you're trying to like Ace of Roller loop and hope you can do that for like two or three turns while you collect and power draw. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be testing this out like for certain. I'm pretty sure it's not good. But on the off chance it works, I mean, I'm going to be there day one trying to get 35 cards in my hand. I know that much for sure. It's so silly. All three of these cards are so silly. I love them. I hope we get more. <laughs> um, next that we have Unknown Missing. This is the third. This is your active Pokemon. Your opponent has 12 or more supporter cards in their lost zone. You may choose to win the game. So ways we can get Pokemon into the uh, supporters into the lost zone, sorry. We have Lysander Prism Star. If you run uh, a load of fire Pokemon and just one or two unknown missing, um, you can potentially get six, so you can uh, meet half of the cost immediately uh, by just throwing six supporters into the Lost Zone with Lysander Prism Star. We also have Trumbeak, which puts itself in the Lost Zone and then uh, looks at the top card of the opponent's deck, and if it is a supporter, it puts it in the Lost Zone, so that could be seven, eight maybe. Uh, nine, ten could come from... Uh, a new giraffe rig, which I'll we'll talk about, we'll, we will talk about momentarily, uh, which lets you put uh, put cards from your opponent's discard pile into the lost zone as well. So similar to Lysander, but on an attack. And finally, there is a Sloking that lets you um, it lets you look at your opponent's hand and just pop a pop a card from the, their hand into the lost zone as well. So just in general, there's there's actually not that many. Uh, well, there's there's a lot of different um, sort of methods of getting them and getting supporters into the Lost Zone for your opponent. But at the same time, Trumbeak is pretty random. Uh, Giraffarig isn't random, but it, like, it, it's not a reliable way of... It's only two cards, so it's um, you'd, you'd have to do that six turns in a row without your opponent playing things like Power Pad. It, eventually, they'll just stop playing supporters, so you can't do that anyway. Um, Sloking is, again, kind of random, but at the same time, you can also... Uh, like if, you, if they're stopping playing supporters around giraffe rig you can then start attacking with sloking and do the similar thing so you know there's there's lots of cool different ways of doing this but unfortunately i think it's i, I don't think you can actually ever um realistically achieve this consistently enough before they've taken six prizes uh, all of these pokemon have like you can see the maximum sloking has is 120 so it's not a huge amount to hit uh, 90 on the giraffe rig as well it's just they can probably take uh, they could probably deal 100 damage six times before you're able to put 12 supporters in the lost zone if they're playing somewhat smart. So it's a, another really, really cool effect, and I really hope we get more of these crazy effects that are super hard to achieve. Um, but this one, I think, is actually probably the worst of the three. Yeah, this feels like the least realistic, because decks really are playing, like, 14 supporters total. So even if they just, like, prize three, like, you lost just because they prized three <laughs> supporters. Like, what? How's that even fair? And like, yeah, it's just really just out of your control, I think, a lot of the time. Again, a highlight reel. I'm going to try and do it. I'm going to stay up for like 24 hours trying to get one game where I win with missing. But 
it's going to be a rough 24 hours, I'll tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> On to Wobbuffet. This is only ever a tech card, similar to a Spiritomb that we saw back in Legendary Treasures, just to say no. That's pretty much what the Shield Tail ability says. As long as this Pokemon is on your bench, each player's Prism Star Pokemon can't attack and has no abilities, so it is just a dead slot on their board. Um, and really, I don't see this seeing much play at the moment. If uh, Ditto Prism Star is becoming... Like, even though Ditto Prism Star is like, going to be a staple in a lot of decks, I don't think it's worth committing a slot for your own Wobbuffet because you're hurting your own bench space a lot of the time, um, and you need to get the Wobbuffet out before their Ditto evolves to even have done anything. That's going to be really annoying. I think... The only way I see this is to be a minus 20 damage against fighting decks. If there's something that you're playing that can just stay out of range of fighting stuff, if their Diancy's shut off, you just go for it. Because I think it could be relevant enough for you to want to play the Wobbuffet. At the moment, that's the only real Prism Star Pokemon that I think it's worth sort of countering. Um, but it'll only be a math fixer. And at the same time, you could just be playing something like a Pseudo Wudo, which is kind of more universal... And although it doesn't like directly deal with the Diancy, it's going to force them into awkward situations. So I think at the moment it's a little bit too niche. Yeah, I don't think it's going to see any play. Next up we have the Nihiligo, for, uh, which is another Ultra Beast. Um, really, really cool attack for one energy. Nightcap, this attack can only be used when your opponent has two prize cards remaining. Choose an attack on one of your opponent's Pokemon and use it as his attack. So it's Zorak GX's GX attack for one energy on a non-EX. That initially seems really, really good, uh, but you do have to be on two prize cards. When your opponent has two prize cards remaining, so if they're on two prize cards remaining, you have to uh, either be winning the game, which an attack like this c can do theoretically, which is cool. Um, but also, if you're not winning the game, you can't be losing the game, which means you have to have no GXs on board um, because they probably have outs to Guzma plus knockout at that point in the game. Uh, so you have to not lose the game. If you're not winning the game, and if your if your opponent sees this in the early turns, they can probably start thinking about it early as well. They can play around it a little bit. It's not super easy to play around, but because it is a specific number of prizes, they can play around it. Right now, we have uh, Mimikyu, which kind of does a similar thing. Um, for one more energy, it does Copycat, which they should copy the last attack they used. Well, if your opponent's uh, using an attack, it's probably going to be a good one, so you're probably going to get a good Copycat, which is nice. Uh, but that also has Filch, which lets you draw two cards, so it's also a little bit of inbuilt consistency, whereas the other attack on the Hiligo is just active, uh, their active Pokemon is poisoned or confused. So it's a really, really cool attack, uh, but I think in practicality, Mimikyu is probably going to be doing a similar effect a lot of the time, but it doesn't. you don't have to be on two prizes, and in a deck like that, you probably have out to something like a Necrozma GX, which can, which can just take a big knockout anyway, so... I think in general, it's less likely to be, um, as it, it's going to be less impactful than a mimic you would be in a lot of situations, even though theoretically it is more versatile. It doesn't have to be the attack they just used. Yeah, I think if there's one thing I learned from our last set review where I love the Celesteela's Moonraker attack, it's that because it's only useful on one turn sometimes, it's not worth a slot in your deck. Uh, the one like sort of caveat to that is obviously Baby Buzzwell, but that's because Sledgehammer's good all the time. It's insane on the turn where you use it. But it's still useful on other turns of the game. Nightcap is similar to room, uh, Moonraker, where you're just trying to find that one spot to make it work. And it's just not going to come off in enough games for it to be worthwhile being put in your 60 cards. Next up, we do have that Giraffe Rig. We've already mentioned it for that Lost Burial attack and how it can combine with Unknown. That's not why we've rated this a two-star card. We're actually thinking of putting this in as a tech card in Mill so that you can try and disrupt your opponent trying to do Oranguru loops against you. If you can get rid of their Rescue Stretcher or if you knock out their Oranguru with like a Kakui play with Fairy Wind and then move into a Giraffe Rig and quickly get that Guru in the Lost Zone, they can't get to it and you can continue with your Mill approach. There's going to be a few other important cards that you can get rid of here and there with that Lost Burial. And I think just getting those out the way could be a real great win condition for you. Even against things like Malamar, if you can get like the opening few psychic energies in the bin, uh, sorry, out of the bin and into the lost zone, it can give you some time uh, to be setting up your board to try and deal with them a little bit better. I think this Giraffe Rig is going to be a really nice one of for not necessarily Sylveon because it always hates not leading an Eevee, but something like the Steelix Wellord deck or the new rendition of those sorts of mill archetypes, whatever it may be now that we have things like the Choice Helmet 
and this and Faber. I can see a lot of support coming out for Mill, and I think Giraffe Rig will go into those decks to sort of negate the tech cards that certain players may be using. Yeah, I agree. Next up, we have the new Nagada, which we have already mentioned a couple of times in the video. Uh, this is a really, really cool card for Ultra Beast decks. Uh, first off, noting the Poi Pole has the eye opener attack for a single colorless. Then you look at all of your face down prize cards. So for that little bit of extra knowledge, um, you also know the placement of your prize cards as well. So you kind of know uh, what, you, what you're able to pick up at certain points in the game, which is a nice uh, caveat to have. Uh, but the Naganada itself, 130 HP, uh, non EX, this is the first non EX Naganada we've got, and it has the ability to charge up. Once during a turn, you may attach a basic energy from your discard pile to this Pokemon. It's actually a really, really nice ability um, because its attack is an awful turning point as 80, and if you have exactly three prize cards remaining, you're doing 160. With a choice band, that's 190, that's a nice number in general, but just as three for 80. Uh, this is a really, really nice attack. Good typing means that you're knocking out a lot of cool Pokemon right now, Buzzworld is starting to see more play. So just in general, um, having a nice non-EX attacker that powers itself up um, and also knocks out everything in their deck, or all, all of the fighting stuff, um, all of the psycho elite stuff, sorry, in their deck is really, really nice. Um, but obviously, charge up can also be combined with um, a couple of other sort of different archetypes as well. The main one, of course, is Blacephalon, though. Uh, Blacephalon being able to, or the deck being able to attach energies to Naganadel um, itself and then just throw those away uh, with Blacephalon's attack rather than having to get rid of energy on your attacker itself means that, you know, you have a bit more consistency. You don't have to find as many energy each turn um, for actually attaching to attackers because you can just get a couple of Naganadels out. Two Naganadels means you're doing 100 damage technically if you can always find ways to get energy in the bin and with things like Acro Bike and Heat Factory. You're going to be able to do that uh, for sure. So it just in general, it's a really, really nice way of being able to power up Lacephalon whilst also having nice type coverage. Um, and just just in general, like like we said when we were talking about Lacephalon, the whole deck comes in a nice little package in this set. Um, so yeah, it's just an obvious combo to pick up and has done well in uh, Japan in the past few weeks. So we know it's a combo that is tried and tested and will probably convert pretty well over here as well. Yeah, I agree. That ability is great. And Turning Point is a deceptively cheap attack. It may say three colorless on the card, but that ability makes it way cheaper. It essentially is a DC attacker if you just have stuff in your bin. Or if it's been on the board for a turn, you've done charge up turn. Like the first turn it's coming to play, then that next turn you can just manually attach, use a second charge up, and it's good to go. So you can really stream these attacks against Buzzwell, and it makes Bercephalon have a very good matchup against that deck. So... Yeah, very good to note that Turning Point is actually a real threat. Next up, we have Lunala GX. I'm not going to waste time on this card because it is an utter waste of time. Pause now if you want to. <laughs> next, up we, <laughs> next up, we have Onyx. Um, this is uh, a, looks like a really bland card as well. 120 HP, 4 for 120, colorless attacker. Um, nothing too much to say because there's no real text on this other than the fact that it's a splashable attacker, obviously, because... Uh, it's all colorless, meaning that, that it can go in a Malamar-style deck uh, that deals with Zoroarks. Malamar, in general, has always had issues with Zoroark. Uh, so it's just nice to have a really, really cool answer to Zoroark in a non-EX attacker that you can technically power up in a turn. Um, nothing much more to say about that other than the fact that it's a good type that beats um, a deck that Malamar has always struggled with. Things it's kind of competing with are Marshadow that's already being played and a new Lava Tire that we'll talk about momentarily. But just in general, there's not much to say other than that it helps type coverage uh, in what used to be an awkward matchup that now looks to be um, probably maybe even favorable for you just because of this one card. Next up, we have Donphan. This is an interesting stage one with a built-in Focus Sash as, as its ability. If the Pokemon has full hit points and will be knocked out by damage from an attack, this Pokemon is not knocked out and its remaining HP becomes 10 instead. Now, there is a lot of spread going around right now, so this sturdy does get played around in a few archetypes, but when you're against ones that don't, that is an absurd ability. It's really good for retaining your energy cards to give you more manual attachments throughout the game. It gives you um, more time to just keep building up other Pokemon. It really is a disruptive ability. Rolling Spin is its attack for a Fighting and Two Colorless. It does 70. During your next turn, this Pokemon's Rolling Spin attack does 70 more damage. So if you don't get gusted and if your sturdy ability is working, that Rolling Spin is going to 
get into big one hit KOs when you combine it with Diancy Prism Star, Choice Band, and the likes of those. I think also worth noting is the synergy Sturdy has with Last Chance Potion. Obviously, uh, Don Fan has 130 hit points. You go down to 10, the Last Chance Potion gets you back to full. That's going to be an absolute head slap moment when it comes off against your opponent. It's going to be very difficult for these decks to get around it because you know you can't shut off the ability and it's just really annoying. I think the fact that Donphan is a fighting type gives it a real good chance of seeing some play. We have a really nice package of Brooklet Hill, Diancy, Baby Buzz. All this stuff is just there waiting to be abused and Donphan definitely can do that. My only question mark would be if it's consistent enough to see play because... You are going to need to play DCEs, Fighting Energies, get all your Dom fans out and rolling. Um, it may be a little bit too slow for the format. That's my only real concern here. Next up, we have Hit on Top. This is a pretty cool Strafe Pokemon. Um, it's it's actually one of the... I think it's one of the only Strafe Pokemon we've got in format right now, uh, which is pretty interesting. It's just... It's, it's pretty much all, all that is, though. It's for one Fighting Energy Rapid Spin that you switch uh, your active with one of your benched but it also forces them to switch as well, which is nice. Um, which can be... We do have things like Guzma and Acer Roller anyway. Uh, but in general, it can start to get quite annoying when sort of uh, you're, you're running out of su uh, supporters, you're running out of resources later on in the game. Uh, eventually, if they're not playing like a free retreater, uh, it could get to the point where they just have to constantly sit behind something. They can't attack each turn until you rapid spin them back into their attacker where they get one attack. And then you rapid spin out of their attacker again, so they're attacking every other turn in some situations. Uh, however, this doesn't have particularly good damage output. Uh, Deanti pushes it to 50. Uh, I guess with Choice Panda pushes it to 80, but 80 isn't too shotting anything right now. Um, so just in general, it's not quite good enough. There are some cool Pokemon you can strafe into. Uh, Gumi increases their attack cost, which is cute. Hooper and Shuckle obviously have pretty annoying abilities, similarly with Sigalith. But just in general, the damage output on this guy isn't strong enough to be able to justify a strafe deck coming into the format. Next up we have Lavatar. This is a very, very promising basic fighting type. It has for a double colorless energy, second strike, doing just 10. But if your opponent's active has three or more damage counters on it, it does 70 more damage. So that's 80 base, goes up to 110 with a choice band, which is already hitting for weakness on Zoroark. Uh, for knockouts, but it can go even further with Diancy. So 130 against everything, even when you're not hitting for weakness. They've already got three counters on them at least, so that's 160. That can tick over to a shrine to knock out Tapu Leles, which is disgusting. And if things have more damage counters on them, Navatar's just taking names. This is a really ridiculous card. Um, I think it synergizes so well with a sort of Coco heavy, shrine heavy deck. Um, gives you great type coverage for Zoroark, which is like the biggest headache that we've seen so far. We've already seen a few Americans play Coco Persimian in some recent tournaments. The Lavatar can just pretty much outclass that Persimian because you only need to commit one bench slot to this card and it's a lot easier to get going and you need to physically play less slots in your deck as well uh, because you're already going to play a high stretch account just because of the nature of the deck. Um, we also have Rule of Evil Weavile, that can sort of do a job as well, getting damage counters on the board all over the place, similar to how we've seen um, Coco Honchcrow Weavile sort of work. You can gain a lot of spaces by cutting those Honchcrows and just playing Lavatars instead. Uh, I think this is oozing with potential. Obviously, there are some hiccups here and there when your opponent can Ace Aurora their attacker and Max Potion and stuff like that, then Lavatars doing pitiful damage. But in general, in a deck with this much spread, he's going to be a real threat. Definitely. So, if Lavatar's good, Tyranitar GX must be good, right? Unfortunately not. It's actually one of the worst GX that I think that's been printed in a long time. Um, 250 HP is massive, obviously, but weakness to fighting is definitely not ideal right now. The ability lost out if your opponent's Pokemon are not, is knocked out uh, by damage from this, attacks, from this Pokemon's attacks, put the Pokemon and all cards attached to them into the lost zone. That is a pretty strong effect, to be fair. Uh, but the issue is we don't have particularly good acceleration for dark types right now. Uh, the attacks are also pretty poor. Vicious Sandstorm does 130 for dark, dark, colorless, and does 30 damage to each of your opponent's benched basic Pokemon. Uh, that's not awful, but at the same time, um, it's not obviously taking a knockout, which is kind of what Tyranitar should be doing, um, meaning that you're probably going to have to be two-shotting stuff on a stage two that requires two attach uh, three attachments. That also is weak to fighting. It's all starting to sound pretty bad. Finally, it's GX attack, Smackdown, does 220 damage and isn't a 
affected by and isn't affected by effects on the defending Pokemon. So it's basically take two prizes and lost zone their Pokemon. Uh, that's probably that that's really good as a one time attack. Uh, but because it is only a one time attack, you're not going to be getting very many more prizes with Titar. So unfortunately, it's just not enough. Um, good cards to synergize with this guy, which is really sad considering <laughs> the Lavatar is probably going to be about as expensive as the Titar, just because of how bad this card is and how good Lavatar is. Yeah, it's so sad. Everyone loves Titar, and he's just been mistreated for so many years. I put a Lost World on this slide because I had so little to populate on this page. Like, it's actually embarrassing, this Titar. I'm so sad. But Legacy Titar, let's go. Next up, we have Alola Meowth. This comes with a pretty interesting... Attack for zero energy, as is typical with the Alolan forms. It has Spoil Sport. It does 10. If you go second on your first turn, this attack does 60 more damage. So a quick, cheeky 70 damage that you can get for free is really powerful, to be fair. You can be taking your first prize of the game on something like a Zerua, and not only are you taking a prize, you're also trying to disrupt setup from the word go. Um, or you could be going onto a choice band and doing 100 onto their early Boswell or Blacephalon or whatever it else is going to be. And that's a lot of early pressure. I mean, think about when you go second, go DC Energy Drive. Like, a lot of the time, that's really good for setting up numbers for other decks. I think another cool factor is that you do have Professor Elm, so that you have searchability for this Meowth. Uh, you can find it pretty early, just pay retreat out of your active, or if you're already playing, like, Cocos or Wimpods, stuff like that, throw the Alolan Meowth up there, get that early damage. It sounds pretty good in theory. Um, I think the fact is that you'll be paying retreat on stuff is the biggest downside here because you're basically losing an attachment and then your Meowth doesn't have a free retreat cost either. So you almost lose like two attachments in the process of you doing this spoil sport. I think that's really going to be as disruptive as to you as it will be to the opponent a lot of the time. Yeah, it's a cool attack, but I don't think it's quite going to see play. Next up we have Umbreon, which is a retaliator, which has always been pretty cool effect in pokemon uh it, it, when one of your pokemon is knocked out during your next turn uh the, this attack does 120 damage for one dark energy it's a nice attack uh but at the same time dark doesn't hit too many things for weakness right now and in general if you want to be hitting dark for weakness just play zoroark because it's also a really really good card um we have two retaliators in format already as well we have exact revenge uh, Toxicroak in two different forms. I think there's also one more as well. Uh, but, you know, these haven't been seen play in a format where fighting types and psychic types have needed to be countered. Um, so, yeah, there's no reason for this Umbreon to see play, I don't think. Next up, we move on to the metal types. Real quick shout out to this Alolan Diglett. It has Call for Family, so it's a slight upgrade on the meme Alolan Dogtrio deck. And Elm also searches Alolan Dogtrio, the stage one. So, shout out to that. That meme can live on. <laughs> Next up we have Sizzle, a 120 HP stage 1 with the ability Exoskeleton, reducing 30 damage from all uh, well, reducing the damage from all attacks it takes. That's a nice ability to have, but in general 120, uh, pushing it up to 150 probably isn't going to be quite enough uh, to live through stuff, so you can then Metal Frying Pan, meaning that you're, you have a 180 HP um, non-EX Sacker, which is cool for the Sizzle deck, however the Sizzle deck has not seen any success, so it doesn't really need it. Uh, the attack does 60 plus 70 if your opponent has any special energy attached to them. Again, pretty cool right now considering there's a lot of special energy around. Uh, but at the same, And you can also counter gain this, meaning that you attack for one energy. But at the same time, Scissor isn't seeing play, so giving it an on EX Scissor doesn't theoretically give, it any re give us any reason to play the, card, play the deck any more than we currently are. Next up we have Dialga. This is a pretty promising basic. Unfortunately... We don't feel that Metal's in a great place right now, especially after this set drops with Blacephalon and just other one hit code decks like Lost March and stuff. The attack is time down. For a Metal in two colours, you do 60 and devolve your opponent's active uh, evolve Pokemon and put the highest evolution card into their hand. The idea is that you have a pretty good out to um, Zorart decks now if you're playing something like a Metagross or a Magnezone where uh, you force their Zoroark up to the hand and you dealt 60 to the Zerua and you can knock them out similar to all other sort of stage 1s or even other stage 2 decks. Like, if you're facing a mirror match, you can just uh, knock out Beldums and stuff like that. That sounds really powerful. Uh, the thing is, it'll only ever be a one-of, and I don't feel like it sort of outclasses, like, sort of big one hit KO GX basics that you could be playing instead to sort of take two prizes on Zoroarks and in mirrors and stuff like that. I think that's the issue with this card. Very cute text, 
but I think for one thing, it's not guaranteed in the metal decks, and two, the metal decks seem to be in a weak spot after the set drops. Yeah. Next up, we have Durant. This is another milling Durant, of course. Has the attack Mountain Munch for a DC that lets you discard the top two cards of your opponent's deck. Um, in general, the attack isn't as good as the old Devour one because it's only two cards. And it's a DCE, which means a Lele with a DCE you can knock out if you don't play Frying Pan. If you do play Frying Pan, it does live, but at the same time, discarding two just isn't aggressive enough. I think even for Mill variants, it's probably not likely to see play. Um, I don't think it ever sees play in Sylveon. As we said earlier on, we always want to be leading Eevee. Maybe there's a one or two of in Steelix to uh, try and push the Milling ar archetype instead of the Taking Six Prizes archetype because you're running energy anyway. Uh, but at the same time, it's like it's still probably only a one-star card. Just it's not going to make huge waves in either of those decks. Yeah, and it doesn't mill fast enough to be its own deck. Uh, not like the old Durant ever was. Next up, we have Genesect GX. It's a pretty glamorous card that we don't think is overall that strong. It has 180 hit points and is a metal type with the ability Double Cassette. You may attach up to two Pokemon tool cards to this Pokemon. Um, that's pretty nice. There are some good tools out there. Attaching double frying pan or double choice band can have some pretty cool implications. Blast Bomb is its first attack for Metal Metal Colorless doing 130. And Metal Metal Colorless Break Buster GX doing 190 and don't apply resistance for this attack's damage. Um, although this ability is strong, it is awkward to have to like to draw into multiple tools a lot of the time. And similar to what we were saying with Dialga, I don't think this is outclassing any other sort of basic GX attacker that we could be using, um, like Dosmane, uh, Necrozma, stuff like that. I think it's too much work to attach a bunch of tools onto this Genesect. There'll be times when it's only got one tool attached, then Blast Bomb's damage is terrible. Break Buster's uh, damage is still reasonable, but um, if you're trying to be tanky, you can just lose to Field Blower and stuff like that. And now there's Faber coming out as well. There's more ways people will be removing tools, I guess. So... I think overall it's just kind of underwhelming. Can't really stand up on its own because it's too expensive attack cost-wise and it doesn't outclass anything that we currently have. Yeah. Next up we have the new Solgaleo, which I realized today I'm pretty sure we've actually talked about once on the channel already. <laughs> uh, but even so, this this card is still really, really cool. Um, it's a stage two, obviously, uh, with a really, really strong ability, giving all of your Pokemon uh, no weakness. Shining Mane is so strong... Um, or at least was, well, I think is again now, uh, Fire is good again. At the time, we saw this uh, initially when Volk was, like, bottom of Tier 1, so we were like, holy, this is really, really good. It means Meta doesn't lose to Fire anymore. Uh, since then, Volk's been rotated, uh, and we didn't see this card until now. So <laughs> this card was really, really good and has unfortunately just got worse over time uh, to the point where it now has finally been released. Though we do think it's a three-star. Obviously, there's some good synergy with the other Sogaleo as well like moving around retreating with ultra road uh, switching sorry with ultra road is really really premium at the moment uh with no field blower uh, with no floatstone sorry so being able to do to, to move around and have no weakness is really really nice turbo strike is a good setup attack dc for 120 damage and attach two basic energy from your disco pile to one of your bench pokemon obviously mega manetric had this attack which was really really strong um but at the same time you, you know it, it's it's not as strong as it was when we first saw the card. Pronos GX finally for a DCE heals all damage from each of your Pokemon. Um, that Now that is really strong and I think it is still as strong as it once was. 250 HP is huge. It's very, very difficult to hit 250 in one shot. So if you're able to move around, sit behind a couple of Solgaleos, let them take a couple of hits, um, you can actually push to be able to... Um, heals so much damage off that it basically resets the board, which is nice. At the same time, Turbo Strike, the, like the one notable thing, I guess, for me about Turbo Strike um, is that it does wrap into 190. Like, t okay, it's not it's not super easy. You need double Delmise, which sounds kind of gross. But at the same time, you can hit 190. And DC for 190 and setting up a Solgaleo and Steel Strike on the bench is really, really cool. Um, just in general... It's kind of hard working out what to pair this card with. I've seen people talking about pairing it with Zoroark, uh, people pairing it just Quad Solgaleo. Uh, now we have Ditto, we kind of have five Cosmogs, so it's a bit better. But at the same time, um, I think the formats just got worse for this card. Initially, it was like crazy good. It was potentially even a five star when it was first released. But in general, the format has gone down a direction in which that Solgaleo just isn't as strong anymore. Um, I think it will 
potentially see play. This is actually legal uh, slightly before Lost Thunder is out. It's actually legal on Lost Thunder's release date. So for the Leal special event and um, League Cups following that, this actually is legal straight away. So you may start seeing this card a little bit earlier than the other cards. Uh, but that being said, I don't think it's meta-breaking, uh, at least not as meta-breaking as it was when it was first revealed around a year ago. No, it does feel like a little clunky. I think, again, it's just victim to the aw- like awful supporters that we currently have in the format. Stage 2 decks really do need to have some sort of engine to keep them rolling. I think Zoroark might be the most promising way to make this Sogal OC play, but yeah, just the awful supporters we have in the format really do... Uh, highlight how it awkward it can be to get stage twos working next up we have gramble a very interesting and cool card uh, that does have that dead broke attack that really did make a name for itself in japan it does 30 base and if you have no cards in your hand this attack does 130 more so we were raving about zerora doing 160 for three how about you do it for one on a non-gx that sounds pretty insane you have Choice Band to go up to 190, a Golden Threshold for a lot of basic GX Pokemon. You have 130 hit points and resistance to Dark as well, so you're straight away annoying for Zoroark as well. Even though you're not getting one-hit KOs on them, you're just a real frustrating card to deal with a bunch a lot of the time. And how, how are you going to function as a deck with zero cards in hand? Well, the answer is to have a heavy Guru Cargo engine supporting you to smooth over into the ideal cards that you need to keep going in your turn, and having a lot, a lot of item cards that you can instantly play. Lots of Lost Mixers, uh, which can remove clunky cards from your hand, same as Ultra Ball, in case you're drawing into too many supporters that you can't play all at once. A bunch of Insta plays like Nest Balls and Ultra Balls, and a very low count of very good supporter cards. Things like Diantha, which can instantly pluck perfect cards out of your discard pile for reuse, is going to be fantastic here. Like two or three copies of Guzma, a handful of supporter cards at most, but really, really focusing on a heavy item engine that you can just play all down at once and rely on that instruct plus smooth over combo to make sure that you can keep attacking every single turn for ridiculous output on a non-GX. I do think this deck does have a lot of potential and there will be sticky turns here or there where you're not doing much, but typically you're doing a lot of damage and for a non-GX that's no bad thing. Yeah, it's a really, really cool attack. I like it. Next up, we have Alolan Ninetales GX, which is another really, really strong card. It seems like I've got all of the strong cards this time, which is really, really weird how it's worked <laughs> out. Um, once during your, its ability um, is like just so strong. Once during a turn, we play this card from your hand to evolve one of your Pokemon. You may search your deck for two item cards, reveal them, and put them into your hand, then shuffle your deck. So this can get B-strings. This can get rare candies. This can get uh, custom catchers. This can get so many different com- like combinations of those um b string like double b string is es- essentially when you play this card from your hand a- attach four energy from your deck to your pokemon that's like bonkers um rare candy wise evolve two of your pokemon to their maximum stage you know it's just so versatile and so strong it evolves from alolan volpix which is a really really strong card anyway so uh y- you have inbuilt consistency for your deck um, anyway, but then on top of that, once you've got the kind of setup you want, you can evolve, find some of these more broken cards, things like B-Strings, Rare Candies, and Custom Catchers, like I say, um, to be able to then push your already strong board setup that you've been able to make um, vi- like make happen because of Beacon. You can then push it doing even more broken stuff, attaching more energy, getting more Stage 2s out. All of this good stuff is really, really strong. I think, like... This is one of the best abilities we've seen in a long time. It's crazy how good this card is. We've seen how good just tutoring one um, with Magcargo is. This technically tutors two. It has to be items. But a lot of the time, items are what you want. We have Lele for supporters. We have the ball search cards for um, Pokemon. So you can essentially get whatever you want from this card. So yeah, Mysterious Guidance is just crazy good. But then it also has two really, really good attacks as well. The first attack, Snowy Wind. The 70 damage for a fairy and a colorless and 30 to one of their benched. So it's like a mini night spear for two energy. With counter gain, that's a mini night spear for one fairy energy. Uh, that's that's pretty good. That's a net gain of 100 damage for one energy, which is really, really nice. But also spreading it around in something like a Decidueye Ninetales deck is a really, really nice way of being able to set things up early, being able to deal with threats early, being able to drop some counters with Decidueyes and then finish them off with Snowy Wind. 
you know, it's really, really versatile. It's just super, super strong. I think it's um, a really, really underrated attack. And it's like we saw how good Dark, uh, Night Spear was uh, on Darkrai. Snowy Wind uh, does the same sometimes for one energy, which is really, really cool. And Sublimation GX, if your opponent's active Pokemon is an Ultra Beast, it is knocked out. Uh, we've already talked about Bacepha on this uh, in, in this review, that looks to be probably Tier 1. Buzzwall has just seen a huge resurgence and is probably Tier 1, at least going into the early portion of this format, because of this card anyway. So for mirror matches, you have um, a really, really strong GX attack that, again, can attack for one energy if you're behind on prizes. Uh, it means that you can just you, you can attach to the bench instead. It's just so, so good. There's nothing I don't like about this card. Um, yeah, I, I could rave about this card all day. It's just... I think it's so, so busted. Yep, it's absolutely incredible. And as Jack hit the nail on the head, uh, Alolan Vulpix is just such a good card right now. Elm pushes it even further into just being, like, good in evolving decks. But, like, you just have Beacon anyway. Why wouldn't you try putting in, like, one of these, one of these or two of these? I think Desi Tails does get pushed. I think um, Boswell, it's guaranteed to go in that deck. We've already seen it so successfully because B-String is such a ridiculous card to hit on the right turn. Great for so many stage 2 decks. Like, Alolan Vulpix was already played in, like, Metagross and stuff. Why not just throw in Alolan Ninetales to then get into your candies or your max potions? Some really critical cards are item cards in the format right now. Same for things like um, Gardevoir. That could really deal with the Ninetales. And again, you can power up the Ninetales to attack to improve your Buzzwell matchup, which was previously a little bit sketchy because having a sublimation GX attack just for two attachments is really good, whereas otherwise Guardi needs to get huge to start swinging big. So I think there's so much synergy that this can go into, and Beacon is just... You don't need any reason to put Beacon in your deck. It's just good anyway. So having those games where you can then evolve afterwards is just incredible. Um, and again, the Vulpix is Brooklet Hill Searchable, which is, again, synergistic with so many things. So... Just a really ridiculous card. This can go into a straight Ninetales deck as well when you're using predominantly the water Ninetales. And you can just go Mysterious Guidance, get yourself two Aqua Patches and get that steam rolling as well. So there's all sorts of applications of this card. It's really, really insane. And the community agrees with uh, 82% saying it's a five-star card. Next up, we go on to Xerneas Prism Star. It has 160 hit points on a basic, which is really incredible. Very tanky and annoying. It even has a a dark resist on top of that. It has a really cool ability, Life Road. Once during a turn, when this Pokemon moves from your bench to become your active, you may move any number of energy cards from your other Pokemon to this one. So it's going to take all the energy from the rest of your board, pop it into the active, so you can start swinging with Bright Horns for three Fairy. You do 160, and this Pokemon can't use Bright Horns during your next turn. I think, as I just mentioned, Gardevoir with the introduction of Alolan Ninetales GX and potentially this card, I think it's becoming slight, somewhat maybe more of a threat. There are definitely avenues where this card can see play. <laughs> Using Gardevoir more as sort of a backup attacker whilst having Secret Spring to power up things like your Xerneas's and your Alolan Ninetales sounds like a really good combination of things to get it rolling. Um, and you're much less reliant on getting like two or three Guardies up start powering one up massively. I think you can sort of do that in the background while you use these other attackers effectively to take prizes. Brighthorn's doing 160 with Choice Band again. It's just golden numbers right now. It's just such a good GX, uh, sorry, such a good Prism Star card that it's going to be really annoying for your opponent to deal with. It's so tanky and just so much commitment is going to be forced out of the opponent. And when people commit to attackers, it helps Infinite Force respond on them straight away. So I think it's an excellent addition to Gardevoir to really reduce the pressure on getting multiple Gardevoir set up turn after turn. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of Gardevoir, there is also a new Gardevoir in this set as well. It's a non-GX version, though. Um, has the first attack uh, that's the same as Sylveon, Brilliant Search, which you search for three cards and put them into your hand. Um, obviously, this, in some scenarios, may be better than Sylveon, but at the same time, it's probably slightly worse just because you can't do this turn one, and it takes up a stage two slot, which isn't a Gardevoir. Uh, then it has a second attack, Sensitive Ray, which is 70 plus 90 if you play the support card from your hand. So uh, this is 160. Again, fantastic number. Can be set up in a turn with a DCE plus a Secret Spring to hit 190. Um, really, really strong. Very, very reminiscent of Sensitive Blade Gallade. The 
Good thing about Centre Blade Gallade, though, was one premonition meant that you knew exactly what you were top decking or drawing with auxiliary to always carry on searching for what you needed. Um, that was a, an ability combo rather than an attack. So you couldn't be judged out of it. You can be marshaled out, out of it. You always got the value from those cards. And secondly, Gallade gave really, really good type coverage, one of type coverage, but it had it was a different type. God of War doesn't hit anything for another type. Um, if we didn't have an Onyx attacker right now, this could be a nice one-off Onyx attacker. But because Xerneas was released in the same set, I'm pretty sure this is just outclassed as an Onyx attacker. And Sylveon outclasses it as a setup Pokemon, as does Alone Nine Tails and Alone and Vulpix. So it's a really, really strong card, but unfortunately, it's just outclassed by a couple of other things, meaning that it probably won't see play. Yeah, just a little too slow there for that Gardevoir. Next up, we go on to Ribombi. It has a pretty cool ability, Mystic Buzz. As long as this Pokemon is on your bench, whenever your opponent plays a supporter card from their hand, prevent all effects of that card done to your fairy Pokemon in play. It does have 60 hit points, which is worth noting because. Uh, it can be searched out by Elm. Also worth noting is that Cutifly has free retreat, so it's by no means a bad line to be putting in your deck. I think if you are going to go down sort of a different approach with your Gardevoir, you could have the Honey Gather Ribombe, one of this Mystic Buzz one, and like two Cutifly, and you've got Ditto already that can go into the deck. Trying to protect your Guardies from being hit with things like Guzma. I think if you're going down this line, this is where you're trying to build three Guardies up, and just going ham on attachments on the back. It can't get Guzmud up. And then when you're ready, you bring it in and start swinging, trying to get one hit KOs. I think overall, it'll probably just be less consistent than the other Guardi builds that we've experienced previously. But that ability is strong, and just making your things untouchable is a pretty good uh, idea in the game. It's just that the sort of engine doesn't really back it up at the moment, I don't think. Next up, we have Mimikyu GX. This is another really, really cool GX, but unfortunately, I think falls below the line of playability. First attack lets you uh, confuse your opponent's active Pokemon. Uh, whilst we have Guzma and Acer Order in the format, it's not as useful, but still in the early game, can be quite annoying. Second attack, Cascading Barrage, does 10 damage, plus 30 more for each damage counter on their active Pokemon already. Uh, that's a really, really nice sort of uh, attack that does a huge amount of damage really, really quickly. If you've just got a couple of Cocoa Flips or some Shrine damage, uh, you can actually attach a Counter Gain plus a Fairy and Cascading Barrage for a huge amount of damage in one turn. Um, but that being said, I think in general you want to be aiming to flood the board with damage and then use the Lele, uh, the other sort of baby Lele to take six prizes rather than just try and take two prizes on a half damage Pokemon um, in general. And finally, Dreamfish GX is the same as Tapu Fini's. Shuffle one of your opponent's bench Pokemon and all cards attached to it into their deck. Sorry, it's not the same as Tapu Fini's. It's, it's like the opposite um, because you can only shuffle their bench Pokemon. Um, again, it's not really doing anything. You're not leaving anything annoying in the active. It's, it gets rid of one of... It get, gets rid of something that maybe they're setting up on the bench um, to try and win the game with, but at the same time... Uh, a lot of the time just Guzma tr trying to Guzma knock it out instead is probably going to be more beneficial because you're not only accelerating your win condition but they're losing resources at the same time so in general it's a really really cool card but I don't think it's good enough just because Cascading Barrage uh, doesn't quite fit the same kind of play style as like a spread deck would like to see Next up we have a quick carbink to mention it has the Wonder Ray attack which is why we're talking about it it does 30 Prevent all effects of attacks, including damage done to this Pokemon by the attacks of your opponent's Pokemon with abilities during your next turn. We've seen how Chimeco has been used to great effect in Malamar decks to buy yourself some time. Potentially the Carbink could be doing the same with Wonder Ray. Um, obviously they can evolve up their stuff and then like Guzma around you, which is probably why this card is terrible. Finally, on to the colorless types. We have Miltank, which is probably the Pokemon you've all been waiting for right from the start of the video. Uh, 130 HP, fighting weak, uh, basic Pokemon, obviously a bit awkward. Uh, Milk Cannon for three, colorless energy, uh, does 60 damage times the number of Moomoo Milk cards in your hand that you reveal to your opponent. You don't have to shuffle them in, don't have to discard them, you can just show them that you have all these little jars of milk in your hand. You'll be doing 60 times the number you show. So if you have three, uh, you're going to be doing 180, which is a nice number. Uh, you can either play Choice Band to push it up to 210, which again is a really, really good number, or you can start playing things like Choice Helmet to make yourself a bit tankier. 
and try and trade up against some of these uh, EX and GX Pokemon, which is really cool. With like a Mag Cargo engine, we could see ourselves finding these Moo Moo Milks relatively consistently. Obviously, things like Judge and Marshadow will shuffle them back in. But again, if Judge counts are seen as two at the maximum, you maybe have once, once or twice in the game where you're not quite hitting uh, the exact numbers uh, you need to be because you ha you've had to maybe deal with a knockout at the same time. Uh, but in general, this is a really, really cute attack. It's a nice non-EX attacker. And I think with the double Mag Cargo plus Oranguru engine, this could potentially be another of these sort of um, fun introductory decks that isn't maybe super viable, uh, but is at least a lot of fun. And maybe we'll even sneak some cup wins, challenge wins, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe even a day two here or there as well, just for the absolute memes of Milk Cannon. Definitely a very spicy meme. That two star for experimentation is basically just me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Lugia GX. Uh, this is a basic with 190 hit points, weak to lightning, which is a little bit awkward. Does have a nice resist to fighting, though. It does come with three attacks. The first for three colorless is psychic. Does 30 plus 30 more damage times the amount of energy attached to your opponent's active. So it reads very similar to Espeon GX's Psychic, but with 30 less base damage. Then it has, oh my goodness, Pelagic Blade, I want to say. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, for four colorless energy, you do 170, and this Pokemon can't use that attack during your next turn. Um, 170 is not the worst baseline. Choice Band gets you up to Lycanroc KOs, I guess. Um, not quite hitting the mark against Zorark, which is a bit annoying. And then it's GX attack. I actually think is one of the worst attacks. Uh, for three colorless, you do Lost Purge GX. Put your opponent's active Pokemon and all cards attached into the Lost Zone. Now, you're dealing with the board, but you're not taking prize cards. And a lot of the time, that's what you want to be doing. I'd much prefer, you know, Lost Purge doing an amount of damage, and then if it knocked them out, it would go to the Lost Zone instead, similar to how we saw Tyranitar. I think Lost Purge is actively something you don't ever want to do, because a prize race is typically going to be the way you win the game. Although you're dealing with the board, you could just be doing something like a Tapu Fini GX attack and shuffling it back in or whatever. Because um, for 3 energy, that's a really expensive cost. Overall, I think all these attacks don't do enough damage. And if you're looking for an attacker that has a nice fighting resistance and is colorless, you've got Shining Lugia to do that job. I think there's ev if there's ever a home for Lugia GX, it would be in some sort of Zerora focused Vikavolt. Because you basically don't want to use any fighting or like you just lose the fighting without them. But at the same time, I just think there's so many better alternatives you can be using instead of this Lugia. Yeah. Next up, we have Trumbeak, which obviously I've already mentioned when talking about the Lost March stuff. Again, I'm not going to bleat on about the archetype, but this is another Pokemon you're able to get into the Lost Zone. If it's in your hand, you may place it in the Lost Zone and then look at the top card of your opponent's deck. Uh, if it's a supporter, you can Lost Zone it. If not, you return it to the top of their deck. Gives you a little bit of knowledge. Maybe you're able to play around something. Maybe you're also able to get rid of a Guzma or two or a draw supporter, that kind of thing. Uh, but in general, it's just pretty much in here as a damage booster for Lost March and that archetype in general. Next up, we have Ditto Prism Star. This is an incredible card in the set. Everyone needs to get their hands on one of these. It's absolutely ridiculous. The community 90% say it's a five star. We completely wholeheartedly agree. It's a 40 HP basic colorless that has the ability Evolve into anything. During your turn, you may play a Stage 1 Evolution card from your hand onto this Pokemon to evolve it. So essentially, Ditto can evolve into any Stage 1 Pokemon. This is absolutely nutty. If you're playing something like a Zoroark deck, just having a fifth Zerua is amazing. If you're playing any deck that has multiple Stage 1s, again, this Ditto can be either card, so when you're in that situation where you draw one but not the other piece, you can just Ditto and just evolve straight into it. It's going to be insane for these sort of split attackers, like we mentioned, that Solgaleo, where you're going to try and have a quad list. Now you can have five basics to start evolving into, so it's less painful when your opponent's going to be picking them off one by one with Guzmas, and it just means you have access to more in the early turns. Um, it's just going to be amazing for the Mag Cargo Mag Cargo deck. It's going to be insane for every Zorak build that has other Stage 1s involved in it. And even just a like a Control Zoro build, the Ditto is insane. It'll see play in a bunch of decks as well for its tech ability. Because now you can commit Stage 1 Pokemon tech lines to your deck whilst only committing one slot. Because you're going to be using the Ditto Prism anyway if you're evolving into other Stage 1s. This is the real key factor here, I think. 
some cards that have been outside of or sort of on the fringes of play really do get a look in now thanks to Ditto Prism Star. Effects like Alolan Muck, Machoke's Daunting Pose, Delcatty's Search for Friends, Zeb Striker we've already mentioned, um, Smootho the Mag Cargo just as a one copy, like these sorts of cards being inserted into the deck for far less commitment because you're playing a Ditto anyway. Sure, there are those games when the card doesn't come off, but that's the whole idea of a tech card. But it's so much less painful to commit that slot because it's only one card in your deck that you're sort of quote-unquote wasting in matchups where it's not useful because the Ditto is useful in every matchup because it can evolve into anything. That is the name of the ability, and it serves the perfect purpose. It is just a ridiculously good card. Yeah, this card is... It... Like, it's just absurdly good. This, along with Elm, push this format hopefully into a better place, which is really, really nice. But yeah, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Finally, we have Kecleon, which is another of these Kecleons that changes type based on the unit energy it has attached to it, uh, which is a really, really cool effect. Obviously, if you uh, have a particular weakness to grass, fire, or water, uh, you can attach a... But you can play some unit energy and um, attach a unit energy to it, and you can be tongue slapping for 10 damage plus 50 more to evolve Pokemon. So 60 plus um, a choice band is 90, uh, which is obviously doubled because you want to be um, hitting for weakness. You're then doing 180. Trying to punishment pushes it to 190. It's a nice number to be hitting, uh, but that being said, unit energy, this unit energy isn't seeing any play at, at the moment. In general, there are grass, water, and fire decks around right now, so they're probably being countered by one another anyway. Um, so yeah, it's a really, really cute combo, and maybe at some point it will be the answer to um, some kind of issues a deck has, but right now it doesn't seem to be a particularly clean answer to either of the, any of the three types when they're kind of all countering each other anyway. Oh my goodness, we've done it. We've made it to the overall ratings. It's been a long old journey. Thank you so much, guys, for listening to us this entire way. Here's the breakdown. 41 one-star cards, 12 two-stars, 17 three-stars, 9 four-star cards, and 5 high-flying five-star cards. Four of them on the screen right now. And our final five-star was the electric power as well. Um, some really good stuff in this set. We do think there will be some emerging archetypes that really do push the boundaries of the top tier. And there'll be plenty of current decks adapting to the situation as well. So, hope you guys did all enjoy this set review. Um, it's been one of our longest ever. Plenty of cards to analyze. It's been an absolute blast trying to create deck lists and theory craft things for like the unknowns and all sorts of wacky stuff going on in this set. Let us know what your top five or top ten cards are down below. And uh, all your opinions on what we said. If you disagree, if you agree. We want to hear it all down below because this is such a big talking point. The set is ridiculous and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun and a big headache to test, to be honest, because there's so much to get done in time for Brazil. It's going to be really, really crazy. So, Jack, is there anything else you want to say before we sign out here? I don't think so. I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening all the way through. Um, make sure you let us know, like Joe said, what, uh, what you're most looking forward to. And yeah, other than that, cheers so, so much for watching. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys in another video.